and to those dialing in, welcome to the public board meeting of the Care Quality Commission on 7th of February 2024. Thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> I have a number of uh, uh, introductions or welcomes to do. Uh, firstly, uh, I believe everyone on the screen can um, see, but can I introduce Charmian Pears over in the corner, uh, who joined us on the 1st of February, so still brand new, uh, and will take over, has taken over, as the chair of the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee. Um, we've had a number of uh, new non-executives join us over the course of the last few months. Uh, under our regulations, they have to outnumber the executives, but the bringing more people on to the board has meant that we have been able to appoint some of the executive team uh, to the board as well. So I would like to welcome uh, faces you're all familiar with, uh, but Tyson, uh, Apple, James Mullion, uh, and Mark Sutton, uh, existing members of the executive team, but now formally joining the board. So welcome, uh, colleagues. Um, <clears throat> we have apologies from one board member, uh, Sean O'Kelly, who unfortunately uh, is still ill. Uh, our um, administration here for the illness. Uh, but delighted that Prem Pramitrandarian uh, works on the team, is, is with us, and I know you're shouldering a lot of responsibility in, in Sean's absence, so thank you for joining us today. Um, the last person I'll introduce is uh, Ellen Sams. Ellen she is the chair of our Gender Equality Network representative. And Ellen, it might just be helpful if you'd say a few seconds on uh, why you join us. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for allowing me to join today. Um, I'm here representing all the Equality Network. So I'm one of the co-chairs of the Gender Equality Network, but it's also the, the RAISE Disability and Carers Networks. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, it's just a really op um, excellent opportunity, really, for us to, to highlight sort of seldom heard voices or underheard voices. And also, um, it, it allows me to provide a bit of a nuanced perspective or uh, questions based on, on things that um, you know, we're hearing from an equality perspective. So thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, Alan. And it is, you know, I find it increasingly useful as a sort of conduit to the wider population of our people to the board. So thank you for that. And indeed, your other colleagues who've joined us in, in other meetings. Um, <clears throat> declarations of interest. I know um, there are a couple of things for the record we should note. Um, Mark, I might start with you. Uh, thank you very much. Just a new declaration of interest. As of January, I started as an advisor to Archetype, which is a venture fund based in the US. I don't think any direct issue there, but thank you. And Charmian. Uh, thank you. Um, I should advise that I am an independent uh, member of the HSE Health and Safety Executives Audit and Risk Committee. Um, if there was ever um, any uh, items that involved both organisations, the HSE and CQC, I would bring those uh, this conflict uh, to the attention of the board. Um, secondly, my husband uh, is a non-executive on a uh, housing organisation in Cornwall. We're a small part of that business is extra care accommodation regulated by the CQC. Uh, again, if that was ever to become a topic that uh, was discussed at the board, I would, would accuse myself from that conversation. Okay, thanks, uh, Charmian. I mean, the, <clears throat> the first thing mentioned, I, I see as a mutuality of interest rather than a conflict, but better to have it recorded. And for the avoidance of doubt, uh, <clears throat> that role your husband has, uh, we, it was looked at, uh, the Department of Health signed it off as, as not an issue on your appointment. Uh, I was also consulted, and I think in the highly unlikely event that we ever at this board discuss anything that uh, could conceivably impact your husband's role, then obviously you would be uh, need to accuse yourself, but I say it's unlikely, but thank you for uh, declaring it. Um, <clears throat> is there any urgent business? We have an agenda in front of us, uh, quite a full agenda. Um, is there anything urgent people want to put on it before we start? Uh, looks like not. Um, the, the first item on the agenda is the update from the executive. I would say we'd allow 20 minutes for that, but actually since the agenda was put together, there is an awful lot on that agenda. Uh, and uh, Ian, as part of your opening remarks, you might also uh, pick up on one thing that's not here, which is the work we've recently been asked to undertake in Nottingham. I think that would be of interest both to the board and to people listening in. So I'm going to allow um, about half an hour for this first session, if we could try to keep to that. Apologies if that means we run over at the end. I'll try not to, uh, but just warning in advance that I think with those extra points, we may just run over slightly at the very end. But Ian, over to you. 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Ian, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you said, quite a lot uh, going on at the moment. So if I do what I normally do and take this paper and the next paper in, in one go, and then we can come back with, with questions uh, after that. So kicking off on Regulation 9A on visiting, uh, many of you remember, particularly during COVID, there was a, a very important public conversation around the right to visit, the right to be, a com uh, to be a co uh, accompanied by people um, when you are either resident in a care home, going to a hospital, or, or indeed in a, in a hospice. Um, the, uh, in the latter part of last year, uh, government set out a new regulation, this Regulation 9A, um, relating to visiting, visiting, it is worth stressing. It is care homes, it is hospitals and hospices. It is not just uh, not just in social care settings. Um, it's designed to ensure that people have visitors and can be accommodated by advocates, even in the, these fairly complex environments. But we, uh, whenever there's a new regulation published, we need to publish a, a we need to publish guidance to accompany that new regulation. Um, so we are consulting now on that guidance, and that consultation is open until the 20th of February. It is worth stressing this is not a consultation on the regulation itself. That was carried out by the Department of Health and Social Care last year. Um, this is about the guidance component of it, it's the CQC component. So I guess I would appeal to any, any members of the public or any providers who are listening in, um, if they want to, to, um, to comment on our guidance, then they have until the, um, the 20th of February to do so. Uh, moving on uh, to the next page, um, we are we're commencing work on a dementia strategy. Um, we have, uh, as part of our purpose, the need to regulate providers and to promote improvement is something we, we take very seriously. And we've seen in other areas like, um, like maternity services or mental health, um, when we look across the country uh, and look at themes, we can make a, a bigger difference if we have a thematic approach to uh, to some, some sorts of services, and that it therefore makes improvement uh, much more structured. Um, we feel that given the impact of dementia on so many of the people that are being looked after in those that we regulate, and indeed sometimes in terms of how it impacts on us internally, um, that, that both in terms of health and social care, it's important to stress this is not, again, not just a social care issue, uh, that it would be really worthwhile having a, a dementia strategy, um, and we can make sure that, that, that we can learn lessons from that strategy, and then embed them into our single assessment framework, so that when we are regulating on a regular basis, we can link directly back to this dementia strategy. So work is ongoing, and, and James can talk a little bit more about that if, if colleagues would like. Um, moving on to the National Maternity Programme, uh, you'll be aware that we carried out a, a, a maternity programme uh, over the last 18 months or so, so we have a, a post-COVID view of every maternity service in the country. The field work was uh, completed in December, um, and we're now just writing up those individual provider reports. The last few are, are being written up. Uh, and we're also going to be doing a summary report from which we'll spin off a number of other, other products. Um, and, and some of that will be about creating products that, that, that individual practitioners are using uh, in terms of identifying good practice uh, and making sure that we can find ways to uh, embed that good practice into our own regulation, but also encourage uh, all providers to try and try and be as best uh, uh, as good as the best uh, in terms of maternity. So we know that it's a particularly important area of work, uh, and it's something that uh, over the over the next couple of months you'll start to see the summary reports coming coming through. Um, I want to move on and talk about Martha's rule. Um, Martha Mills uh, sadly died in 2021 after having uh, developed sepsis at King's College Hospital. And a coroner ruled uh, last year that Martha would most likely have survived had her doctors uh, moved her to an intensive care and listened to the concerns, particularly those that were expressed by her, her mother about the, the case. The Patient Safety Commissioner, Dr Henrietta Hughes, has been asked to develop a set of recommendations for, for, for a Martha's rule in England, enabling families to request a clinical review of the care that, that they are receiving. Uh, the scheme is based on practice in uh, both Australia and, and some parts of the UK as well. Uh, we've been part of the, of the work all the way through this, uh, and the work is proceeding quite deliberately at pace. And, and our engagement has been led by, by our colleague, Joyce Frederick, um, and the aim is to, is to embed the, the, uh, the Martha's Rule, the requirements of Martha's Rule, again, into our single assessment framework, so it becomes an integral part of the way that we regulate. Moving on to organisational matters, um, we are we, we want to. We, we, I've, I've got uh, well, 
I'm pleased to have uh, both, both Prem and Chris in the room today. Uh, they'll be talking about managing risk in the NHS during winter in a little bit more detail in a second. But I think the headline is that we've continued to ensure that we work in a proportional way over the winter period, balancing the needs of the public with those of, of those delivering services under very significant pressure. I think, I think we do need to acknowledge the significant pressure that both health and care system have been under over this last winter period, but also recognising the impact that has on the public and our role as a regulator trying to navigate between those two, the, those, those two important uh, perspectives. Um, this year, we've, uh, we've used the work that we've refined over the last couple of years that, 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 was, uh, that was very much led by, by Prem and, and colleagues in, and in the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. And we've, 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 generate, we, we, we've refreshed it, but we've also, again, embedded that within our single assessment framework. And I think that's, that's been the new thing this year, is that we've been able to make sure that as, as part of our regulatory work, there is clear regulatory value being derived from that, from that work. And, and Prem can talk a little bit more about that in a second, exactly, and take exactly, exactly what that means. Um, we've been also working closely with the, the, uh, the, re uh, the regular NHS groups that manage winter uh, to make sure that we can be, that there's an effective escalation point. We understand when things are going, going, uh, going, going, uh, going, going, going particularly badly in, in some areas and we can support appropriately. Um, moving on to the Thurwell inquiry. Um, we, um, we know that uh, for the, in terms of the farewell inquiry, we've received a formal request for information and we have been designated as a core participant uh, in relation to the work that we did in, t in regulating the Countess of Chester Hospital. Uh, our first draft of statement has been submitted uh, and will be, f uh, and, and will be uh, finalised and formally submitted uh, as, as a final statement in the next few days. That largely covers uh, the, the background to what we do as an organisation and, 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 and our methodology uh, during the, the period under review of the inquiry. The second part of our submission will be a second statement uh, and that will cover the more detailed, um, detailed issues of exactly w when we went in and who we spoke to and so forth, that more detailed specific inspection dimension of our inspections of the Countess of Chester Hospital. Um, and we expect hearings to start in the autumn. Uh, and we will obviously be giving evidence at that point. In terms of the COVID-19 inquiry, um, we have submitted our application to be a core participant for Module 6, which covers the care sector. You'll recall that we have submitted evidence for earlier modules where we were not a core participant. Uh, we took advice from the inquiry and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't deemed appropriate. Being a core participant is, is a, a positive in the sense that it enables us to have greater range of access to material than the average member of the public would have, um, but it does also mean there's a significant amount of work and a significant expectation that, that if we've got access to the material, we have read it, analysed it, and again, we, 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 are, we are proactively responsive to the information that other people are offering. Um, in terms of technology, uh, there's a couple of pieces in the, in the report around technology. Um, significant amount of focus at the moment, as you would expect, on the transition from the project part of the future regulatory platform through to, to making it a live, a live service. Uh, and that, that's taking up a lot of the time of, of the, both the programme team, but also uh, Mark, uh, Mark Sutton and, and his group. Um, I just want to just record an enormous thank you for a number of colleagues who've been involved in, in that. Um, you know, oftentimes we just see this stuff happen seamlessly. Uh, it very much doesn't happen seamlessly. So an enormous thank you to, to, uh, to my technology colleagues for, for the great work they've been doing in that area, alongside colleagues from the, uh, from the, uh, the programme, some of whom will be with us later on. Um, we uh, will be launching our new intranet uh, shortly. Uh, whilst there's a big technology component to the new intranet, um, there's also a big, uh, uh, there's also a significant component around refreshed content. So again, Chris uh, and his team have been working incredibly hard to, to refresh the content of the intranet. Um, the intranet in this organisation is a, a really important tool for inspectors to access quickly uh, guidance and other information. Um, and so we want to make sure that it's, it is as accessible and, and as up-to-date as it possibly can be. And the ability to search for things quickly is, is there and hence the, the work that's gone on recently. Um, data and Insight, the Data and Insight team have been working hard as we've, been, as we've gone live. Uh, with the single assessment framework over the last uh, few weeks, they've been looking at how the data we've been collecting um, can be can be 
can be rendered in a way that's accessible to individual managers, uh, individual decision makers and policy makers to make sure we're making the best possible use of the, of the, the data that, that, uh, that we are collecting and that, those, uh, that, we, that we're creating new dashboards relatively quickly. It's one of the, the kind of unspoken, un, unsung benefits, I think, of the system is the ability to take data and very quickly render that in ways that, that it can be used for a range of different purposes, which is which is really positive. And finally, uh, as Ian invited me to just talk about where we are in relation to uh, work in, in, uh, in the Nottinghamshire area around mental health trusts. Um, you will know uh, in the last uh, few days the, the trial of, uh, of Mr. Calicone concluded uh, after he pleaded guilty to uh, three counts of, of manslaughter with diminished responsibility. The Secretary of State has asked us to carry out a so-called Section 48 review. It's Section 48 of the Health and Care Act, and what that does is it enables the Secretary of State to ask us to carry out a piece of thematic work uh, to look at uh, events or themes uh, across the, the area that we would normally regulate in. So we're doing, we've been asked by the Secretary of State to look at, at a couple of things. One is to look specifically at Mr Calicone's uh, care, as well as to look at the care that other people with similar health conditions uh, have, have received. Um, from the same trust. We've also been asked to provide some some specific advice around uh, the, the, the relicensing of the Rampton Forensic Secure uh, facility. Rampton is one of the three forensic secure uh, uh, mental health hospitals in this country uh, and has some specific um, specific role to play around uh, around women who've been detained but also uh, people, people who are deaf. So it has some very unique, uh, a very unique role in, in the country. We've been asked to do this work at some pace. Uh, we've got colleagues who are on site doing doing work now, and we're expecting to report to the uh, Secretary of State in the early part of March for her to make a decision around Rampton's relicensing, uh, and we'll be doing case reviews uh, during that period uh, as well. So, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Um, huge amount there. Um, <coughs> I'm not going to attempt to take the items one by one. I think we'll leave it to colleagues to ask questions. Uh, just wondering, would it be helpful, there is a lot in here about winter planning, would it be helpful just to dive straight to that on the grounds that we'd like to know more? So, Chris and Prem, can I hand it to you just to say, don't repeat the papers, the papers. we've read the papers, but what do you want to highlight, because it is an important issue. Sure, uh, just to begin, and I'll, before I hand over to, to Prem, as Ian said, this is about trying to understand and assess risk at what we know is a very difficult uh, uh, time. We've also been providing advice and support on good practice, um, and particularly in light of our work on uh, patient first and people first, focusing on a system response. We know that issues that operate in urgent emergency care don't all have their origins in urgent emergency care. So some of the, the support we've been providing is around the system context in different areas. Um, I'll hand over to Prem, our, our um, uh, National Professional Advisor for Urgent Mental Care in a second, but just to say also our approach hasn't just been to focus on urgent mental care, but also focus on building capacity in social care. Uh, so part of the work we've been doing, we know that there's, there's still strong pressure in, in, in adult social care, so focusing on building capacity through our reinspection of services, um, particularly prioritising registrations and reinspections of services that are uh, requires improvement uh, to get them to get them to good. We know that with that good rating, they're more able to to take on further work. So um, I, I just want to hand over to Prem because I think Prem can talk through. Um, obviously, Prem, as you know, uh, a national professional advisor, uh, but also works at an outstanding trust at Frimley. Um, has got some really, I think, some really interesting insights into the work so far. We will aim to publish a full uh, report on what we found over the winter period to guide our own thinking in terms of system reviews, but also to help and support uh, trusts as they make those difficult decisions around risk. But Prem, I wonder if you want to say a bit more about that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> I think what I'll do is I'll give you some overview of the current situation and what the CQC response to the winter pressure and the few new uh, single assessment framework how actually transform the um, ob objective way of assessing uh, EDs. I think the first point I want to make is uh, this winter is no different to any other winter. Uh, I think in order to understand the problem, I think we need not only to look at the data, but also listen to patients, staff, 
and also along with the culture and leadership because they make a big difference. Uh, I think staff work very hard in the service at the moment uh, in a very difficult circumstances. Uh, there's no respite in the NHS uh, winter. And also it's a major spike in winter uh, viruses, uh, flu, COVID, in norovirus. So that's piling up the pressure on NHS service. So what's the problem with that actually is this impact on quality and safety of patient care, surgeon ambulance call out, handover delays, crowded emergency departments, increased corridor care, lack of social care beds. You know, uh, these pressures are being compounded by worrying level of staff sickness as well in this winter. So these are all causing more problem. But I must say, despite the changes, uh, some trusts have made some improvements better than the others by doing successful virtual ward, uh, so reducing the number of admissions, uh, same-day emergency care, and also other things, important thing is collaborative working and also risk sharing make a big difference in some places, doing better than the other places. I think, as we know, the only solution to the current problem is the whole system approach. That's the only way to solve the problem. The problem actually is a black, uh, so like a block in one part of the system causing serious problem to completely different uh, to the other system. Particularly, there's a gap between the health and social care. So that's actually, as Chris mentioned, it's a big problem. And also, the, there is, the trusts were almost working as series of s small islands rather than working together. Uh, and also there is, we talk about, yes, there are 120,000 staff vacancies, but there is a lack of teamwork in most of some of the places, complacency and normalization of certain culture and practice, that's making the situation worse. So CQC are committed to system-wide change to emergency care. So this in line with the response to winter pressure we are committed to work with providers. Uh, it's really important, and system partners. And also the major stakeholders, particularly uh, NHS England, to fulfill our role to make sure that social care service provide and also the health provide people with safe, effective, compassionate, high quality care. So I think what we have done this time actually, because of the change in our uh, process, uh, we are using, as Chris already mentioned, using the patient first and patient people first documents to support the uh, system to mitigate some of the problems. And also, as an organization, we want to appreciate the system are in a lot of uh, pressure. So we don't want to increase the pressure by doing some very intense uh, inspections or assessment. So we are very aware of that. So we have frequent conversation with external stakeholders like NHSC regarding our approach to the problem. We use previous winters called Pressure Resilience 5. So this time what we have done is we have mapped the Pressure Resilience 5 to single assessment framework. And we are going to trial that in different part of the system to see how it's work. I think I am very confident this new form of single assessment framework will make a better uh, understanding of uh, problem and more objective and transparent approach. Uh, and also I think it's not this time, the inspection is not going to be just uh, emergency department, but we want to look at the whole system and how they are approaching the risk as well. There's a good example. Uh, this approach in East of England recently made a significant improvement in mitigating uh, safety issues in the system. And also, I just want to finally, before we ask for some questions, in order of the magnitude, things right go, right go more than wrong, actually. So sometimes we spend a lot of time in looking at the wrong things, but it is important not to lose sight of the good things people are doing and appreciative and uh, 
there are staff doing amazing things often in a very difficult circumstances. So I think, okay, there are difficult situations in the winter, but there are pockets of good practice as well. I think we need to recognize that as well. I'll stop there for questions. Thanks, Prabh, for indulging the uh, good practice as well. It's so easy to overlook. Questions on any one of the 300 subjects we've just covered? Christine. Thank you. Um, more, of a, more of a sort of comment, really, about the dementia strategy. Are, the, are you ready to talk about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, first of all, I'm, I'm very pleased that we are um, focusing on a dementia strategy. I think it's very important. I'm also really pleased that it's cross-sector, so it's also health, because I, my belief is that health lags behind social care. <coughs> um, but then I really just wanted to reiterate a couple of points. One is um, the importance of genuine co-production, which really does involve a wide group of people and, and isn't, isn't a sort of afterthought. Um, and the second is to ensure that we look at innovative practice that is already out there, particularly innovative providers where there's a lot to learn, particularly from social care. And by innovation, I don't mean technology, I mean actual practice. That saves me asking the question I was going to ask, so thank you for that. Uh, James, do you want to respond? Well, thank you, um, and good afternoon, and, and thanks to Christine for raising uh, the issue. It's, it's really important uh, uh, that the dementia strategy begins with the aim of us improving regulation and starting with the key question that's outlined in the paper about what is people's experience and what's the experience of carers. Part of the rationale, therefore, is to work up the strategy in a way that allows us to build a really good picture of what good looks like so that we can take that into our inspection or our observational frameworks and test as it were provision and health care provision against against that ambition um, but this process of developing the strategy and um, applying that process is also about cqc developing and strengthening its own uh, skills level and understanding level both in practice terms for social care and in clinical terms for, for health. We can only do that actually by bringing in expertise. So the very nature of the approach really is to work with national organisations who've got that expertise and to, and to bring it to ourselves and then uniquely apply that to our, our regulatory role. So I think it's a really important point that Christine makes that the, the co-production approach has got to be at the heart of, um, of how we operate it. And, um, just, just uh, it's a really important, just to state the obvious, it's an incredibly important issue both for older people and for some uh, younger older people, as it were. And it's um, the, now, uh, after the pandemic has receded, it has returned to be uh, the principal uh, cause of death in England and Wales. That's not a death sentence. There's plenty of work that can be done with people with dementia, plenty of prevention work. So it's a really worthwhile move for CQC to get into uh, this improvement agenda. Okay. I, I mean, given the increasing prevalence of the issue, I, it seems entirely logical to be commended. Thank you. Mark, you had a question. Uh, th thank you. Uh, it's actually two on the broad ranging topics we've covered. The first one, still on dementia. Uh, again, very, very welcome. The, the question is the central question of the way it's worded. I just wanted sort of confirmation that it will include diagnosis of dementia, not just people who've already got the diagnosis, because that seems to be a very critical part to make sure there's good care. Uh, and, and if I can be cheeky, I'll ask the other question, which was on the, um, on the emergency care, uh, very, very helpful mapping of the, the PR5 to the SAF. It just struck me that one very important line, outcomes, was blank. And I just want to understand whether that's a, uh, it didn't map. Is, that, is there something that we're missing there? Is there a gap there? Or is that what, should, what we would be expecting? Okay, well then, <coughs> James, and then I don't know whether Pam or Chris, but I should thank you. That's my second question being asked, so we're doing well. Uh, James. Well, just to confirm, yes, the early diagnosis and the, and the variable experience of that process across England, yes, absolutely at the core of the uh, scope. Thanks, James. Chris? Just to do, two, I think, two, two points on, on that. Uh, um, Primary care is involved in the co-production as well. So just to say, just to sort of link that, link those two points back together, it starts with the, the, they're not just involved in the in the production stage; they're involved right from, right from the uh, from from the get-go. I think it's um, what we're in terms of the outcomes. 
a lot of this is, a, is about outcomes that appear elsewhere in urgent emergency care. So we're, we're looking at pathways as well, and it's probably not, as very, not very clear in the document you've got there. So what we could probably do when we come back with the, with the final report, we'll, we'll, we'll show you the link between the information we've gathered and the wider outcomes. Because part, part of the issues here, the, the, the work we're doing is around outcomes that happen before people arrive into urgent emergency care or after they've left urgent emergency care. They aren't about the physicality of being in that environment. So we'll, we'll try to uh, cover that off when we, when we pre present the final report back, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think I think I agree with uh, Chris. I think it's a good question actually. But the, what we are doing is, rather than fix that in the outcome, the, all the other things will capture those outcome in this one as well, rather than looking at separately outcome. So it will be one of the other three things will capture those outcome part of it. <clears throat> That's your question, Mark. I, I, I think so, but I like the fact that we'll get more detail when it comes back to sort of see how it impacts. I mean, I think we've got to always remind ourselves that we're, we're you know, outcome sounds very close to impact, and that's what we're trying to drive. So making sure that in the approach that we're doing the assessments that we're actually keep that always in mind. Uh, and I, I understand that it m might lie outside of the specific service that we're evaluating. So very helpful from that point of view to get more detail. Steve. I wanted to raise one about the Thelwell inquiry, if we're, if we're okay to move on to that. Um, and it's really just sort of how do we as an organization take the learning from that whole incident, uh, disastrous and, and tragic as it was? And there it's clear that you know we are responding to the Thelwell uh, inquiry, and that will uh, hopefully you know, get a full, deep understanding of what exactly happened there, what went wrong, how could it have been uh, avoided. And there may be some th uh, a sort of different form of learning that, that we need in addition to that, which is more about given developments over the years since the Letby case, do we feel we can now be fully confident that if people had that sort of concern, those working in a care setting uh, or service users, if they have serious concerns, would they now be confident with everything that we've tr tried to put in place in raising those concerns? Would they know how to raise those concerns? And would people listen? So it's kind of updating that, that whole horrible set of circumstances to the present day Say, so with everything now in place, freedom to speak up, guardians, the emphasis we put on well-led within the single assessment framework, uh, the, 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 the welcome we now have to, to help people raise concerns and worries, could that still happen? I think that would be useful learning for us. So you'll do it. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. I think that's a really, it's a really, really important question. I think there's a number of, there's a number of strands to, to what you've just described. I think... Um, in terms of freedom to speak up as a as a starting point, um, I think I think the notion of of speak up is now much more embedded than it was. Bear in mind, you know, th th this relates to events nearly nine years ago. So, um, I, I think people have now uh, seen freedom to speak up work well. Many organisations have got freedom to speak up guardians that we you know we obviously host the guardian service. In fact, actually later on the agenda we'll be we'll be hearing from the guardians directly. So so in that sense I think I think the the architecture is is, is there, the framework is, is there. I still think though as part of our work we are still hearing examples where individuals are, are not necessarily feeling that they can speak up. I think there's probably people know how to uh, but whether they choose to for a range of other reasons around fearing detriment and so forth is 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 i think a, a is still is still an open question i think i think the the spreading out of speak up as a concept into things like um perfect the professional regulators the professional expectation that one will speak up as a doctor or a nurse in, in particular i think is more, far more embedded than it than it once than it once was so so i think i think people know more uh, if i look at I look at on a practical level within cqc we've seen something in the order of about a 50 percent year on year increase in give feedback on care from members of staff and and indeed from the public as well because that's a subset of this i think potentially so i think we are better known as an organization people understand give feedback on care they understand concepts like speak up 
Um, but there is this, this, I think, the continuing question around is the culture in the place the right, the right thing? And it's something which, within our single assessment framework, we are explicitly looking at. So, again, it's something which, which we continue to, to test. I don't think hand on heart I could, I could sort of say I am absolutely uh, certain that, that people wouldn't, you know, that, that, that there would never be a situation where someone wouldn't speak up. Um, I think in terms of the specifics around maternity, We've just done the maternity work that I was referencing uh, a few minutes ago. And I think, again, that will give us a sense of, of culture within maternity services uh, and whether maternity services as a service type is different to other services. I suspect it may be in some respects, but may not be in, in other respects. Um, but I think the other component to this is probably making sure that we're learning the lessons directly from the Thurwell inquiry, because you know one of the things that was quite striking about about the, the Lucy Letby case was how long it took the police to investigate the matter, how long the trial took, how long the jury were out for. That would suggest that the case was incredibly complex, and, and I, I, sus I suspect that the, the inquiry is going to struggle to come up with, with really short pieces of learning. But I do think as we follow the trial and, and, and being a core participant will be really helpful because it will enable us to, 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 to learn as we go uh, during the, during the, the, the inquiry itself. So, so I think a number of things. I, I don't think I can, I can say a definite yes to your question, but it's the, exactly the right question. So. Well, it is encouraging that things that the organisation has naturally tried to do better and developing appears to be responding in the right way. But uh, as you say, let, let's see what the committee says. Um, would it be all right to come in just quickly on the dementia strategy? Um, uh, one for James, really, around um, what the dementia strategy means for, um, for, for CQC staff who are carers and whether we're considering co-production with you know, carers at CQC and also just in terms of um, staff who, existing colleagues who uh, develop dementia as well. just wanted to ask that, thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks for the uh, question, Ellen. And, and um, it, it points to a good point for uh, CQC as an employer, but actually all employers uh, of uh, large, uh, large employers of carers. So as, as the question in the paper says, part of our approach in the strategy is to consider the lived experience of people with dementia, but also their family carers. And so a great deal of that, our focus will be what should good look like um, for those people and some of the research that we're undertaking as well to uh, for, for formally um, record where best practice and innovation is. As part of doing that, for us as an employer, we'll learn what good practice looks like and can bring some of that uh, into the organisation. But of course it would make sense too, given that we are a large organisation with many family carers inside us, to, to use that resource as, for our own internal uh, research. So we will be reaching out to the carers network to, uh, to, to, to do that. Thank you. David. Uh, it's not just older people, but we have an increasing number of people with early onset dementia, and that is from really aged 30 onwards, which is, you know, not generally known by, by people. And these are individuals that also require a great deal of care. You might like to know that the, we, we don't refer people from Dementia UK, from our nurses, to many organizations, but the principal one that we certainly we do refer to are the Samaritans, because so many carers of those with dementia um, are on the suicide risk list. So that offer is there, James. I, I hope it's helpful to you in terms of co-production, etc. Thank you.
Thank you, David. Uh, I mean, let's just capture that as an action and take it offline. Christy, we should probably make this the last question in this morning because we have other people joining us. Chris, sorry, if there was something, I'll come to you, but Christine first. Thank you. I just wanted to go back to the Thirlwall inquiry and just sort of really to get some reassurance that um, as an agency that had a, a role in relation to the Countess of Chester at the time of um, the Lucy Letby um, uh, act crime, um, that we've taken this as an opportunity to learn as we've gone along, not rather than waiting for what will obviously be a complex thermal inquiry and, and probably relatively slow as a result of that, but we've used it as a learning opportunity and that um, the, the analysis of, of that will come back to the board. We can certainly do that. We, we absolutely have already done that, but we can certainly do that in, at some point in the future. Chris, did you want to say something? Just, it's, it was on the point of um, how we encourage uh, colleagues in organisation in, in Anstead, in part by saying we've seen a big rise in um, people using Give Feedback on Care in care settings to give us feedback to direct, direct um, frontline uh, staff. But we've also used different techniques over the past uh, year, year and a half in particular, where we've brought people out of their normal environment to hear their story. So often we, we have some initial uh, concerns that we're not hearing everything we need to hear, particularly when we do a well-led review. So we've got used to the idea of physically relocating the conversation to a different place so that people feel more able to give their views. We've also brought people together as a group. So we actually brought together um, 200 midwives uh, to talk about their anonymously to talk about their experience of care across the country and I think both of those techniques are things that we wouldn't have done four or five years ago but they are very good at eliciting information that helps us then triangulate what's actually happening in an organization and in both instances one's helped with the with the overarching report for the maternity the other one has helped us with two well-led reviews for what would have previously been seen as a very good organisation, but it's helped us get to the root cause. So, I, like Ian said, I don't think we can say this is a, there's a perfect answer here, but I think there's some, some different techniques that we're trying to help people feel confident about reaching out. Thanks, uh, Chris. I think we should probably move on. I actually had four questions and three are asked by my colleagues. Can I just make one as a future request? I mean, it, it, it's implied in some of the comments, but I mean, we obviously are participating in two significant inquiries, neither of which were foreseen. We don't carry lots of staff to do this. I know it's costing us money that we aren't being funded for, and there is also an issue that we are potentially going to have to run at a, a cost and some risk systems that we were going to decommission in order to hold the data. I think it would be helpful in the future board if we just have some sighting of what it's costing the organisation, what we're doing about it, and the risks we're running as a consequence. I mean, there is no choice, but I think it would be helpful to have that visible. But that's for the future. Thank you very much indeed, colleagues. I did say I would let that run on. It's rather more than I thought, but there was so much in there, it would have been completely wrong to stop it after 20 minutes. Um, <coughs> we, um, Kate and Chris, over to you, I think we have a corporate performance report. So I think, Kate, you might want to introduce it. Um, usual rules, we have read it, uh, but uh, any points you want to highlight, and then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, so this is uh, our corporate performance report uh, for quarter three. Um, I'm going to shortly hand over to Chris, who will talk a bit about a couple of performance highlights and talk about the um, internal audit actions. But first, I just wanted to talk a bit about risk. So you might have noticed in this paper that the risk um, section is larger than it usually is. And that reflects the work we've been doing as an organisation uh, to really challenge ourselves about whether we're judging our risks accurately and particularly on the, the kind of question of likelihood. So we've had discussions as a SRT30 um, group, so our senior leadership team. We've had discussions as an exec team. We've also benefited from a new uh, risk manager who's come and, and joined our organisation as well. So I just want to talk to a couple of risks that you would have noticed have moved, and then I want to talk to the three risks that are still exceeding um, tolerance, if I may. So very briefly, risk um, S2 around effective governance in place. Uh, the likelihood of that has reduced as a result of the work we've done around establishing uh, subcommittees of the exec team and really implementing our commitment around one-touch decision-making. Decision so that has uh, had some successes. Um, 
um, People and Culture Committee about two weeks ago also agreed to an increase in resources within the governance team. So this is a very lean team uh, that has, uh, will really benefit from having more colleagues uh, doing the job as well. So uh, we see that risk coming down further uh, in response to getting some more colleagues in the team uh, working on that as well. Um, S3 around delivering transformation effectively. Again, that likelihood has reduced because we are now, as of yesterday, live across the country with our new uh, assessment uh, framework. So uh, uh, we will now be, as of uh, yesterday, working with all providers through our single assessment framework on our new regulatory platform. Um, it's uh, been a, a long journey to get to this point, and there's still lots more work to do uh, for us and supporting our providers to work with us differently. Um, but a huge success to have got here, um, and that risk reflects the fact that we are delivering um, transformation as we originally um, hoped to. Um, I just want to move on down to um, P1, the risk around retaining, uh, recruiting, uh, attracting and retaining our workforce. So um, this re risk is reduced because actually we consider the fact that in the last calendar year, in 2023, uh, we had 30,000 applicants who wanted to come and work with us as an organisation. And these are high calibre applicants. So actually that question about uh, are we struggling to recruit um, certainly isn't the case across the board. There are still specific challenges around legal, um, technology, data and insight that we're putting plans in place for. But we felt uh, on balance uh, we are certainly recruiting a good calibre of colleagues across um, those other areas, uh, as well as noting those challenges in those couple of um, uh, groups. Um, and then probably the final thing I want to say just before going to the exceeding risks is um, uh, oh, one, our operational workforce is not as productive as it needs to be. Our new single assessment framework is giving us a kind of level of granularity about what our colleagues are doing and where we are with our assessments of providers in a way that we've never had it before. So now any member of the organisation, any member of the exec team, operational managers now have access to um, a dashboard that shows them where everyone is in the assessment process, which quality statements they are assessing against um, and how far we are away from um, sharing those results with the public as well. So, um, so there's, uh, there's just a few highlights about some uh, risks that have moved um, and are now um, no longer exceeding tolerance. And then I just want to talk to the three that are on page 18 of your um, pack, which are the three that are exceeding um, tolerance. The first one is P1, which is around our colleagues being uh, insufficiently engaged in our cultural change. This is a risk that has reduced down uh, since we've had a conversation as a board about our cultural change plan. So we've got a plan. Um, and over the next couple of months, particularly in April and May, we are engaging the whole organisation around our values and our associated behaviours. So this is a risk that is currently still exceeding tolerance, but we anticipate in the next three or four months or so that reducing down and coming into tolerance. Um, uh, 0202, that we don't make an accurate and timely assessment of the quality of care and risk for people. This is a very time-specific risk. And as I say, as of yesterday, uh, instead of for, uh, for maybe about two months, we've been working on the two systems, depending on where you are in the country, as we rolled on um, the single assessment framework across the networks. Now everywhere in the country is live with our new single assessment framework um, and our ability to have accurate information that we can share with the public in a timely way uh, will increase day on day um, as that new way of working rolls out. So again, a risk that currently exceeds tolerance but will be coming back into tolerance, we expect, by the end of the financial year. And then finally, our last one, um, 05, around CBOR CRM recovery. This is our legacy um, system that we are in the process of decommissioning and we anticipate having concluded that by the end of this financial year as well. So just aware that we've had some discussions, uh, particularly in uh, our audit and risk um, uh, uh, committee, about uh, a sense that some of these risks aren't moving and, and where, they, where they've been exceeding tolerance, we haven't had a plan to get them back into place. I'm hoping the work that's been done over the last month or so shows that um, some of those are now back in into a place we feel comfortable with and where they're exceeding uh, tolerance, we've got a plan now to get them back in uh, into place. So that's what I just want to say on risk. I'm just going to hand over now to talk uh, for Chris to talk about um, performance and um, uh, internal audit. Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, so just a few bits to pull out on performance uh, for the end of quarter three. Uh, first thing to note is we've revised the pack based on previous feedback, so hopefully uh, that's uh, welcome to receive by board. Uh, I'm grateful for any feedback after the meeting or, or during, uh, for that matter, uh, on the presentation of that. Um, so just three areas I was going to pull out. So it's um, similar to last quarter, kind of three probably hot topics, safeguarding alerts and whistleblowing. Um, we, are, we are seeing an improved trend 
uh, in this area, but our previous dip as a new contact centre uh, service went live uh, means we're not achieving our KPIs. Um, we are aiming to close the gap in performance through process review, uh, training, communication, and it, we're now hitting our target and safeguarding concerns, uh, but there's more to do, for example, safeguarding alerts, as you can see in the graph on the right. Uh, it's worth noting that we are taking action, but this is just pulling out that it's not timely in, in, in cases. Um, NCSC uh, res response times, we track four types of call uh, in our call centre, and we see we're just short of target in all except for general inquiries. Uh, we've seen a slight decline from our previous quarter in registration, uh, safeguarding and mental health lines, uh, although in December we did hit the targets for uh, safeguarding. Uh, challenges faced are largely due to transitional period again with our new regulatory platform, but also resourcing challenges in the centre. Uh, and the last area to pull out would be registration. Uh, so currently 46% of applications are over 10 weeks old. Uh, this is an increase on the last financial year and the previous quarter. Um, volume, volume of applications continues to, to increase. Uh, we have resourcing challenges, uh, both of which have impacted on our backlog and ability to bring it down. Several initiatives have been put in place, as well as a booster resource uh, in that service. Um, so happy to take questions on any of those or uh, any other parts. Just a couple of bits to close on. So in terms of our finances, uh, at the end of September, we've uh, got an 8.5 million surplus on revenue expenditure. That's a slightly clouded position due to our budget profile. Uh, if you roll that forward to the end of the year forecast, we're looking at a 5.8 million deficit, uh, which is probably more reflective of our uh, forecast uh, of our finances this year. Uh, that deficit is due to uh, non-recurring pressures, uh, such as the closing stages of our transformation journey and unfunded work uh, that's impacting our grant and aid funding, such as the COVID-19 inquiry. Uh, we're actively managing both of those to mitigate the overspend. On our capital, uh, we are 1.2 million overspent for the year to date, uh, year December. Um, that will come down uh, to, uh, we're forecasting a 0.4 million underspend by the end of the year, and that's following discussions with the Department of Health and Social Care on remedial funding for our capital position. And then just one bit of final uh, close on in terms of internal audit. Um, one thing that, that, that might stand out is that we're we have um, a number of overdue actions in internal audit. So we've got 302 internal audit actions that we're tracking. Uh, just uh, close to 60% of those are closed. At the time of writing, we had 60 that were overdue. Uh, we've been uh, hunting these down one by one, uh, it, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, we've closed 22 uh, since the time of writing. Uh, 23 are finalized, just finalizing their evidence uh, and awaiting verification. Five have asked for uh, an extension uh, with legitimate, le legitimate reasons, uh, which leaves 10 that we're, we are uh, chasing down. So hopefully we'll close them all out in due course. And that's it for me. Okay, thanks, Chris. Belinda. Put your mic on, Belinda. I wonder if you could just elaborate more on the decline in whistleblowing um, performance and what you think the reasons are behind that. Not anybody. <laughs> um, th thanks, Belinda. I think um, I think I think the dip earlier on in the year was to do with our changing on onto a new system, and I think we saw we saw a, a blip in performance at that point, and that's starting to to increase. And I think we're now getting closer to the measure that, that we're striving for. I think, um, as Chris said, um, there's an issue of timeliness here about the, about the top priority ones, but they are they are or action is taken against all of them. Um, I think we we've, we've got evidence that 99% of them have had, have had action taken against them, um, and those that haven't are, st are still brand new and so it's not as if they're being left to language but as Chris said we continue to sort of engage with, with, with our teams on, on what more we can do about that but, but we are taking action we're just not always doing it within the one day. Do you think it's people then not recording things properly in the system rather than action not being taken? They, they could, there could be an element of that, yeah, and that, I think that's part of the investigation that we're doing, is to have a look at whether whether it's not being recorded correctly. I would be fairly confident that our teams are taking action because it's one of their top priorities, but there may be occasions where they're not being recorded, but I think the latest uplift in performance is encouraging. Thanks, Tyson. Any other questions for Kate or Chris? Stephen. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kate, for a really helpful uh, report. Just wanted to pull out kind of a, a couple of linked aspects. One is 
Uh, I think it is right to note on the organisational transformation. Um, just big congratulations. I mean, you've achieved Go Live right across the piece. I mean, that is a huge, huge achievement. Colleagues right across the organisation have contributed to that. It's created a huge amount of work. Great, you know, that is a really, really important aspect of, of performance. It does then have knock-on consequences through to the risk that uh, you were describing, Kate, around uh, colleague engagement, because we now go into the phase of full embedding, socialisation, everybody owning it, feeling they understand it, feeling they can use it. So, you know, I, I, you, you very helpfully described sort of the risk analysis on that, and it links very closely to the work, as you said, being done on culture. The one that isn't here so much is there's also an equivalent need, isn't there, to sort of secure positive embedding of the whole system with providers. And it did make me wonder whether kind of perhaps we needed a little more visibility about how the whole transformation program, now it's in place and rolled out, sits with and works with pr providers. And perhaps, you know, should, could we, should we have a bit more visibility of that bit? Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Stephen, and thank you for recognising the huge amount of effort that has gone into um, where we are today with Go Live um, across the whole country. I think I, I wouldn't be doing it justice if I didn't uh, I didn't note the fact that this has been incredibly difficult for people, and it's still very it's still very fresh. So if we think half of the country went live with this yesterday, um, and even though because we've gone uh, because we've rolled out network by network, we've had the opportunity to address issues as they've arisen, and those issues have been in kind of three groupings really. Uh, one has been uh, techno technology issues where we've uh, been able to put fixes in place when we become aware of them. Some of the, them have been policy um, issues as we've got to grips with implementing our vision around single assessment framework and some of it has been about ways of working. So each, uh, each time a new le network has gone live um, there have been less issues but this is still you know, significantly a significantly different way for our people to work and I think for a, a large number of people despite the training and the fabulous support we have from our super users and many other colleagues this is still a really tough time at the moment so thank you for saying congr congratulations I echo it um, but um, uh, we're still very much in the thick of it internally um, and I, I just see I don't know whether Tyson or Mark might want to come in on that but also um, your point about how we uh, regularly see how this is landing for our providers and I'll, I'll hand over to Chris to comment on, on that side of things so it's a really important point Stephen this isn't just a change um of, of working ways of working for us it's also a change in the relationship with um, with providers and in fact for people who use services as well um, what I would say is probably probably three things uh, firstly we've been really grateful not only to colleagues internally but to the organizations that have been part of the early adopters program because they've really helped us understand how the system that we've implemented and the policy behind the system works in practice and they've been uh, instrumental in helping us unlock some of the, 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 the tweaks and the changes and the improvements that we want to make to the system in the, in, in the short term. Um, it's fair to say that we've, we've held regular ongoing dialogue with, uh, with providers, as we do all the time, but on this particular topic, and we've held a number of sessions where we've been both providing information and receiving feedback for them on how this is working for them. And that's influenced some of our guidance that we've then issued to providers and how we intend to, uh, to, to, to um, deliver guidance going forward. Um, I think the, the, the third element for this is what this will mean in terms of what people view in terms of an assessment on the website. And we've been having dialogue both with providers and actually with people who use services, because obviously this is where it really matters, the outcome of this uh, uh, matters. So we, we, we have ongoing dialogue with with providers and people who use service about how we intend to improve. And I think we've t we talked at a previous board about what we want to do in the short term and how we want to develop it in, in uh, over the next few months so that it's a, a more real-time view of what we think about uh, the quality through our assessment and through other information. But we have regular dialogue, and I think colleagues, some colleagues may have joined ESAG, uh, which is our external advisory group this week, where we talked about uh, transformation as one of the update topics. Um, I finally just uh, end by saying uh, one of the most important bits is that people can hear this and use it to influence what we do next. So we produce weekly 
um, insight information from both uh, colleagues internally and from the views of, of, of providers and, um, uh, and other, other stakeholders, including people who use services, and that feeds back into our decision-making process and into the prioritisation process that we spoke about at a previous meeting. Tyson, you want to add? Thank you. I, I, I wanted to um, first also thank Stephen for his comments, but also to reiterate what, what Kate said. Um, because of um, the fact that we've gone live in half of England um, only yesterday, it's cl clearly a, a challenging time. Um, so thank you to my, to my teams. Um, as a senior team, we continue to step up our engagement so that we are hearing what people are, are saying and also respond, responding to their concerns, and, and that will continue. And while, while I've got the floor, I also wanted to make a point about registration, if I may. I talked a bit at the last board about our plan to deal with the demand in registration around recruiting people, continuing to look at our processes and make maintaining and possibly driving up our high levels of productivity. But I wanted to remind anyone who might be viewing that we do have a priority system whereby if you can demonstrate that you will add capacity to your local system, we can consider your, we will consider your application within 10 working days. And that is, is a system that is used. It's being, um, it's well guided on, on good, it was well guided on our website, but I think it's worth reminding that in, in areas where capacity is desperately needed, we can, we can flex our, our system to make that work. Thanks, Tyson. Uh, let's have two marks. Let's make these last two questions. Are Mark uh, Chambers, uh, question, and then Mark uh, Sutton, next. Well, I, I was just going to answer the, that, that oh, question, okay. if that's okay, that. then, then Mark can ask. Um, so uh, just to reiterate what, uh, what, what Tyson was saying there, uh, just huge thanks to colleagues across the organisation, not just you know, technology and data insight and transformation colleagues that work incredibly hard to make this change happen, but colleagues, uh, our inspector and assessment and regulatory colleagues that have worked incredibly hard to uh, and continue to work incredibly hard to adopt to this what well, is a significant change it's a new way of operating it's a new regulatory model it's new technology it's new data and insight products and uh, we we continue to engage with colleagues we continue to take feedback and make continual improvements and that will go on as you know as long as is necessary um, but excited for the new world that we're we're entering into now well other mark thank you and uh, just back to the risk register, it's great to see this changing because you know, it's intended to be a d dynamic, real-time tool for the team to, to assess the environment in which, in which we're operating. So, so I su support the changes that you've, that you've made. The thing I think you've just got to watch is that you don't give credit for work that we haven't done yet. Having a plan is not the time to change things, it's execution on the plan. Um, and we're in the very early days in terms of what needs to be done in, on, on governance and, and culture. Those are long-term uh, things. And I think even, even in relation to productivity, I'm not sure we've laid, we've got the measures now, better measures than we've ever had before, but I'm not sure we've laid down what our sort of base level of expectation is to work out uh, where, where we stand against that. Um, on internal audit, I think every now and then over time, you just end up with those difficult audit um, responses that prove to people leave, the world moves on, things have changed, and the a solution which looked plausible a couple of years ago just is is not either the problem's gone away or the solution won't work. And I think we just got to have the courage every now and then to clear to go through them as you as you're going, but to clear the deck and then get a very you know a f and refresh the or the the management action plan um, picture. Maybe one of those moments. Thanks, Mark. Um, <coughs> Mark Sutton. There's a requirement to be on the board. These, as so you have to call Mark. Uh, Mark Sutton. Thank you for those uh, observations. I was going to make the same point that we, rightly, I think, congratulate to those who delivered this. But you know, everyone in the organisation is having to go through change. No human being likes change. We recognise it. Puts people under stress. So, certainly, if any uh, colleagues listening to the call, just say the board recognise that, and we'll continue to do everything we can to ease through that process. Um, can I just ask one really detailed point, and, and also echo the points on the risk register. Um, we begin to a stage where it's a live document rather than static, so thank you for the progress being made. Just one really quick question on the um, registration the overdue. We, we focus on this metric of over 10 days old, sorry, um, and two, 10 weeks old, sorry, and <coughs> we understand that there's more coming in so we get a number of staff more comes in inevitably it gets delayed can i just 
gathered assurance on the, the tail end that the risen stuff's just getting too old. I mean, is if everything is suddenly ten and a half weeks instead of ten, that's great. But we didn't, I want to be, make sure there's nothing that's six months or twelve months old. Uh, can you give me that assurance, or do we need to look at away, go away and look at it? I, I, I can't give you the, the reassurance on six months old because there may be there may be a small number of complex um, cases in the system. What I can say is that we also monitor the average um, the average age of the work in the system, which, from my experience, is a, is a sign of a, of a healthy case working system. The average age of the, all of the work in the system, the ten thousand applications, is seven point five weeks, and the average age of all of the applications, the the sort of um, forty forty six percent of applications that are over 10 weeks old, the average age is 12.5 weeks. What we have been doing recently is that the, the older work in the system, we've been going through and putting that into our priority system, so we are dealing with the older work first. We could get the 10-week figure down by focusing on the work that's near, near the 10-week mark. We're not doing that. We continue to, to bring in the tail, as it were. But I'll come back to you on what the oldest cases in the system are, but then we'll, but then we will be few of them. Thanks. It's a detailed question, but sometimes it does happen. You look at averages and you ignore the fact that something has gone off the scale. But that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, but let's uh, thank you for your uh, observations on the report, uh, Kate and Chris. Um, we have a couple of uh, external reporting updates now. The first is uh, from the National Guardian's office uh, and then Health Watch England. I'm going to suggest that we take a short 10 minute break after NGO before we go into HWE. So we might let uh, Louise know. Um, so we're going to be joined by Jane Chidji clark Jane is dialing in. Um, we have a technology problem, I'm told, that um, although people listening in can see this room and they'll be able to see Jane, we cannot see Jane. So Jane, if you are listening, uh, we can't actually see you. <laughs> Oh, I beg your I pardon. We have a tiny computer in the corner, so some of us can see you on that. Um, <laughs> but it won't help us listen. So you were, um, let me hand over to you. Um, we've read the paper. Thank you very much indeed. But if I could ask you to pick up any particular highlights you want uh, us to recognise, and then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for the invite to join you as ever. Uh, it was May last year, it was the last time I came to present formally to board, and it's uh, always good to come and talk about the work of the National Guardian's Office and to hear your questions, comments, feedback. Um, so I will take it as read that you've read the report. I think the things I would really like to highlight, and listening to a little bit of your earlier conversation around the Thirlwall inquiry, I will definitely pick up on that in a moment. But let me just start um, by just reiterating, which I did in May, um, we published a report last year based on the staff survey, and I remain concerned at the decrease in confidence that we've seen again in workforce in the NHS, in their um, in their confidence that they can raise matters of concern and that they will be responded to appropriately. Um, and that remains a concern. And never more was it more important. And when you know we see high profile cases such as Thurwell, that obviously um, just emphasises that. And so the work that you're doing as a regulator, that we're doing in our office in terms of the support through improvements in speak up culture, the work of NHS England and other regulators stays as, as important as ever. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about um, first is what we've been doing since um, the Lucy Letby verdict and um, you'll see in the report on page three that um, there's been various actions that we have taken. I was invited to speak with Secretary of State. We've raised various um, important issues to him and to the Department of Health and Social Care around adding our voice to the, the voice that we need to include increased investment in training and support for good leadership implementation of the CARC review um, and absolutely ensuring that leaders put the high priority on their culture and speaking up culture and responding to workers' concerns um, to um, help reduce the likelihood of, uh, of harm coming from workers not being listened to with that important voice um, in terms of patient safety and worker safety that they bring. Um, I also spoke to him about compliance levers and uh, I feel really um, concerned about the ongoing challenges of enforcement and assurance on a routine basis regarding speak up culture. Um, your work, and obviously we've been very involved with CQC uh, looking at the well-led domain and we've really welcomed you inviting us to look at that with you, um, 
but as ever with a regulatory system, um, you're not in every organisation all the time. Um, and uh, I really welcome the, the new regulatory framework, the more data led, and obviously we can feed in what we know of that. Um, but I'm also very much um, asking NHS England, and we'll be saying the same when I go to their board, that we look at the, um, the contractual compliance mechanisms as well in terms of speak up culture, because that's really going to be important. Um, and I also talked to Secretary of State around strengthening the role of um, and the, the, the training and the support for guardians who provide that additional safety route when other routes within organisations aren't working. I'm happy to take any questions around um, thoughts around Thurwall. I heard some of your conversation earlier. Um, what's really important is this January um, was the deadline for all NHS organisations to have done a review against the new um, NHS England Freedom to Speak Up policy and our joint guidance, um, uh, the sort of the planning and support tool and boards to be discussing that. And I know that'll be part of your inspection of Well Led. What I'm really keen is to ensure that we have some way of seeing if organisations are doing that and taking it seriously. Obviously, there is an, op an option for some organisations to not do this in the, in the in depth um, organizational development type way that we need to see to get real change um, and so it's going to be really important to see how that mandate to do that review is actually monitored and implemented in practice. Um, I've also been talking with national bodies, um, particularly the NMC, GMC and Health Professionals Council, um, looking at what more we can do to strengthen guidance and support for professionals when it comes to escalating matters and understanding their responsibilities to speak up and as managers to listen up and act up and that's really important. We have been undertaking some work with NHS England and you've been around that table um, as CQC in terms of escalation routes um, which the, 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 the ministers asked us to look at um, as a set of patient safety leaders to help reduce the risk of this happening again and that work is really key going forward. Uh, we're not trying to reinvent wheels and invent another regulator, but we are absolutely looking to see what more needs to be done to ensure those escalation routes are known by everybody, um, but really importantly that they're then acted upon um, through the parts. Um, my report covers our speak up reviews and I'll work with partners. I don't intend to talk about that now unless you've got any questions for me. I did want to just highlight the ongoing important work of uh, looking at primary medical services and the integrated care systems because they are less well developed than trusts in terms of work in their speak up culture and they have their um, particular challenges in primary medical services so that work is is really important going forward um, and I think probably what I'd like to do is um, remind you that we laid our annual report um, and you will have seen copies of that happy to take again any questions on that that went to parliament in November last year and I also want to thank um, the Audit Committee of CQC. We had a very uh, robust and useful discussion last year with the Audit Committee around our risks um, and particularly around metrics and measurement and impact. And as a result of the discussions with you and looking internally ourselves, we're currently working with some researchers, which is referenced in here, to look at what um, pre-work can be done to get a successful research bid to look at implementation of the Guardian model. It is time now to look at um, uh, and uh, you know, what models work well, what more needs to be done so we have a more robust evidence base um, and that work is really important going forward but we need the funding to do that. Such research is, uh, is, is uh, you know, has financial implications so uh, we're working to, to do that with our stakeholders. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions, um, comments or feedback on the report um, and our work um, since I last saw you. Thank you. Thank you very much Jane. Uh, questions or comments from colleagues? Steve, thank you. Um, I, I have the role of uh, working with Jane and the, um, uh, the board of NGO, um, which is really helpful. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Jane and, and the NGO organization for all of the work they've done. And particularly to draw out um, the, the importance of this for the discussion that we were having about people's confidence in speaking up but as Jane has rightly identified, uh, there is some evidence uh, in the wider NHS staff survey that actually quite a lot of people don't yet have confidence in speaking up. So there's clearly more to, to do in that territory. The, the other point I just wanted to draw out was the, uh, Jane mentioned the thematic review that uh, NGO did recently on ambulance trusts. 
And I think that was an important piece of work because it, it doesn't just sort of look at how do you put a freedom to speak up guardian in individual uh, providers and, and, and health settings, but it looked across the piece at a group of providers, ambulance trusts, um, and did find some significant issues about culture and, and speaking up. Everything then depends on follow through and the action uh, that, that, that people take, um, which I think is why Jane is, is rightly putting the focus on. It's one thing to do these reviews, it's one thing to come up with recommendations about how we could develop a stronger uh, speak up culture. It's a very different matter whether these things are then acted on and how they're followed up. Um, so uh, we need to put the focus with, with NGO and in, in the ALB on on that question of ensuring robust, timely follow-up uh, of the recommendations and findings that NGO have. Thank you. May I come back um, on that point, please, Chair? Go ahead, yes. Hey, thank you ever so much, Stephen, and thank you for your support on the Accountability and Liaison Board um, and your, your check and challenge is always uh, well received. What I would say in response to that is that uh, the, we're, we convene um, a steering group to look at implementation of recommendations following that review, DHSC, yourself, CQC, NHS England um, and the Association of Ambulance Chief Execs sit on that. Um, and it is really important to keep the focus on this. Um, but in the wider context of review recommendations, we know over the years, is. There's been review after review with more and more recommendations that organisations are, are asked to look at. And there is varying levels of scrutiny of the success of implementation of those, such that um, as a group of patient safety leaders, um, Rosie Bennyworth, Chief Exec of HSIB, is leading a piece of work across uh, many of those, uh, those patient safety groups and regulators to look at um, recommendations and uh, what is in the art of the possible to be much smarter about implementation of recommendations, databases of who is doing what and that whole assurance piece. So that's ongoing work that we're really keen to be part of because the last thing we want to do is to use resource to create recommendations that then sit on a shelf. Um, and obviously there's a key role for yourselves in terms of inspections uh, for relevant recommendations, implementation to see the evidence um, of that, etc. But really important piece of work. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Jay. Any other James. Just um, echo the point that's being made about the importance of the integrated care systems work that we're doing and um, of course quality and safety and leadership are core features of the work um, there and what we're going to look at and the, the two pilots we've undertaken of course are limited. I think as we roll out the work subject to final agreement with, um, with government, as we roll this out I'm sure we'll see themes emerging that relate to both patient safety issues and the, the, the speak up culture actually and it's a good opportunity for us to both reinforce the messages from the NGO but also to gather evidence actually for whether the convening power of that leadership in an ICS is having an impact on the trusts and other NHS organisations that are in local areas. Thanks James. Mark. Um, Incredibly helpful um, report as always, Jane. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I think it's just worth making sure that we, we we don't get overly focused on just one dimension that's that's limiting confidence for people speaking up. Fear and futility are the two main drivers, and there you know there is plenty that can be done to um, uh, you know to 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 better evidence that there are outcomes arising from uh, uh, from people speaking up, uh, even from some of the worst uh, uh, cases that we, we have seen, that will help people uh, ultimately understand that things do happen. Um, the fear one is, is, is hard, that's for sure. Thanks, Mark. Chair, may, may I come back to that one, Chair? Just a, a brief observation around that. Thank you, Mark. That is indeed in, in incredibly important. And um, I think the futility is really um, key. Uh, you know, what's the point? Nothing ever changes. So that feedback loop, seeing, you know, those best of organisations that do keep engaged with their workers and tell them what's happening and showcase, you know, you said we did, whether it's about patient safety, whether it's an improvement idea, whether um, it's uh, it's something else. 
I think the issue of, um, of fear um, sometimes founded because of the detriment that we see some workers who speak up um, suffer for, for, for doing that and comes back to that point that I made at the beginning around accountability and we need to see robust implementation of the CARP framework. We need to see um, as regulators those conversations being had when there is evidence that workers have suffered detriment for doing the right thing, making the place a better, safer to work, etc. Um, and that will remain a, a you know a huge priority. Thank you, Jane. Um, if there's no other questions, I'll just finish with a comment for me. You did reference in the report, uh, page eight, I think, about board development sessions and the work you do for trusts. I mean, just for the record, for people listening, um, you did a development session for this board a few weeks ago. So, firstly, thank you for that. Uh, I think we all found it very useful. And if there's any provider representatives listening, I would commend you to contact Jane and organise it, uh, uh, request it in your organisation as well. I hope you're inundated with the request, Jane, and you haven't got the resources, and that's a problem for you to sort out. Uh, but thank you very much indeed for joining us, Jane. Appreciate it. Thank um, you very much, colleagues. Bye-bye. Having said that I would take a comfort break now, I we checked with Louise. She has a train to catch. It would be unfair for her to miss the train. Um, <laughs> so uh, Jane is joining us. Um, we haven't got that long to go, but we've still got two quite important topics. So I suggest we still take a 10-minute uh, comfort break after uh, Louise. But Louise, thank you for joining us. Um, what I thought I would do is um, <clears throat> ask David, uh, who not that long ago you took over as, as chair, just to give any observations or reflections as a, an incoming chair uh, and a segue into Louise, and then Louise will, will turn to you, uh, just go straight from one to the other. Usual rules, though. We have read your papers, but anything you'd like to highlight, please, that would be great. David. Thank you, Ian. Uh, and when I finish my very brief introduction, I'll go and sit beside Louise, so I'm in the same firing line as Louise might be. Uh, for, for the benefit of you, um, Shamin, because you're the only um, non-executive director who uh, hasn't met Louise before, just briefly, Healthwatch England uh, is a central organization, and there are 152 independent local health watchers. They don't report into Healthwatch England, they're independent entities. And they were set up in the aftermath of the mid-staffs uh, inquiry, and the first chair was the uh, writer of the report on mid-staffs, uh, Sir Robert Francis KC. Um, we're updating everyone today, uh, really because, of course, Health Watch England is uh, constituted as a committee of the CQC, hence we're reporting as a committee. What are we? We're a small independent organization of around 35 people and the chief executive uh, Louise Ansari is uh, going to present uh, our work to you in a moment. But just let me remind all of us of our purpose, which is to seek and report on the experiences of the, the public, of patients and of carers across all areas relating to health care. So without more ado, I'll introduce Louise to you and ask Louise to do the presentation. Uh, right, thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you, Chair, uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, first thing I'd like to say is, is uh, to recognise the very hard work that uh, David has put in uh, since he became our chair in... Um, June, I think it was, wasn't it, well, David? June, yes. um, and uh, David has travelled around the country and done a huge number of meetings with Local Health Watch and really got under the skin uh, of, our, of our movement and, and has, has been a great support uh, even uh, just in the last um, seven or eight months. So thank you, David, for such an excellent start. So I'm not, I'm, as, as you say, I'm going to assume the paper's read. I'm just going to very briefly pull out uh, a few points and then I'm open to questions. So... One of the things I do want to say is to remind people that we do hear a lot of positive comments, particularly about the quality of care in every setting. Uh, unfortunately, though, we have heard uh, throughout the period since I last reported, which, like Jane, was in May last year, uh, about the difficulties uh, many, many thousands of people are having accessing care 
uh, and also uh, the further emergence of a two-tier system uh, where um, uh, some people are paying for care and other people can't afford to do that and some people are paying to get care faster and many other people, around about two-thirds of people uh, who we poll say they can't afford that. So both this access and two-tier system issue exists uh, primarily in uh, primary care and I'll talk about dentistry a little bit but also in elective care, both of those areas still extremely problematic. Um, we had significant input into the dental recovery plan, which many of you will have seen uh, has been released today and reported on, and we welcome that as a, as a really good start. And then in terms of access in other areas of primary care, uh, we've done a great deal of work on uh, the, the proposal around pharmacy first, uh, and we're going to be reporting on that over the next two weeks. We're going to, we've already spoken to the Health and Social Care Committee uh, in terms of whether or not primary, uh, pardon me, pharmacy first is going to work to take pressure off GPs. And whilst there is um, a good amount of support from the public, there are some areas of concern, including access to pharmacy, including medicine supply uh, for a range of conditions, uh, and including whether or not pharmacists, pharmacists are being trained quickly enough or, or indeed if they've got the right spaces within their, within their pharmacies. So we're going to be um, releasing that and we're going to hopefully do another study in a year or so to see whether or not Pharmacy First really will work for people. As has been talked about uh, on and off through this meeting, um, patient safety following the, the uh, Lucy Letby case has been a real priority area for us. Um, and we've also been working with the CQC uh, regional teams to try and improve the relationship between local health watch and regional CQC teams and find a better way of escalating when local health watch have got uh, concerns about safety in a particular trust or other healthcare setting. And then in terms of internally for health watch England, which as David said is, a, is uh, actually quite a small organisation, there's only 36 of us uh, and we have granted over around three million pounds. Um, please note the section of my report on ED&I which flows through uh, every element of our work and the Health Watch England staff survey uh, which showed very positive results um, and we've also got a number of organisational development programmes underway including creating a new culture set for the entire um, Health Watch network and committee and staff. So very happy to answer any questions on any element of the report. Okay, thank you very much Louise. Uh, colleagues, questions or comments? Linda. Thank you. <laughs> um, just wanted to talk more about the dentistry recovery plan because I know that you've had a lot of input into that. Thank you, Belinda. Yes, I mean um, the work on dentistry started well before my time as, as chief exec of Health Watch England, and I would say for at least the last four years, Health Watch, local Health Watch, and Health Watch England have been taking the experience, the worsening experience of people back into the system, obviously, which is our job, uh, and particularly to the Department of Health and to NHS England, and more recently, uh, since commissioning has been devolved into integrated care boards. And uh, what people have increasingly said to us is, uh, has been reported fairly widely, there is a lack of NHS provision that was, I mean, there has been declining provision for decades of, of NHS dentistry, but certainly since the pandemic, uh, that, um, plummeted that, that provision and it hasn't got back up to pre-pandemic levels, you know, nowhere near. And that's created some areas of the country where you pretty much can't get an NHS dentist. I've met people, these are not isolated incidents, who've pulled their own teeth out. You know, it's, it's really uh, heartbreaking actually. I've, I've met people who can't get NHS dentistry for their children. Um, and then we're also finding in terms of the cost of living pressures, that people are avoiding dentistry because they can't afford private dental care and because of the cost of NHS dentistry now. Some people are even avoiding that if they can get an appointment. So through a range of methods, which uh, you could possibly call campaigning to, to a certain extent, we've been exposing this around the country. We've been talking to the media about it. We've given private briefings uh, into the department, into NHS England, who have been very receptive to to what we've been telling them and uh, highlighting the experience of people. Uh, and that has been going on. You have to be tenacious about this kind of change. It's been going on for, for a long time. Um, so we were really uh, delighted, actually, that 
um, the department uh, and NHS England have together worked up this recovery plan, which we think is genuinely a, a really good start to fix some of the issues, but really deep and radical change is needed to fix the kind of underlying issues around the dental contract in order to make long-term change for people. Um, but we, as I say, we're really happy, particularly on um, children's oral health, particularly on things like dental buses, as a short-term fix uh, for some of those areas. And, we, and the network will continue to uh, press on this issue until the, you know, the swell of, of, of uh, poor access dies down. And some of you may have seen uh, Victoria Atkins, our Secretary of State, uh, this morning on the uh, breakfast programme, uh, really talking in some detail about the new announcements. So it's fairly hot off the press too, Louise. Thank you. Any other? James. Hi. Thanks very much. I, I wondered, um, it's very interesting what you've said in the report around the support to the Health Watch networks. And in the context of the systems work we're doing with integrated care systems now at CQC, just your perspective really on how sustainable the networks are, how connected you feel their, their work is in the development of place and devolution of the permission of the NHS to get on and change and improve at a local, a local level. I, I sense from your description uh, in the paper that there's a mixed, mixed picture. Thank you, James. That would allow me to get on my soapbox for quite a long time, <laughs> but I, I respect the time of the, of the board. Um, it, it's, it, the resourcing and the ability for the 152 local health watch to do their job is in an absolutely dire state for most of them. Um, their funding in real terms has reduced by around 50% since the creation of Health Watch in uh, about 10 years ago. They are responding really well to the, to the creation of integrated care systems. Uh, almost all Health Watch are grouping together um, on the footprints of ICSs. And a number of ICSs, actually uh, around 60-70%, are, are giving sp sometimes small amounts of funding to local Health Watch to work together across um, the ICS patch. Um, many Health Watch are, are now on the, on the, in the governance of ICSs, sometimes on the ICP, sometimes on committees of the, of the ICB, and that's all good uh, on the surface. But under, underneath that, the ability of a local Health Watch, who on average they have four members of staff, um, their funding varies from about £60,000 to around about half a million. The variation is absolutely huge. On average, they get maybe 100, 120,000. Obviously, they're commissioned by local authorities. That funding has, has shrunk over time. M many of them do a really fantastic job. But in terms of actually covering the population, being able to listen to everybody's uh, experience, particularly reaching out to communities who uh, suffer the worst health inequalities, they're just not equipped to do that. So I said all of this at the um, Health and Social Care Committee this time last year, and that committee um, did ask the department to look into the resourcing and the structure and the commissioning of Local Health Watch, which I think needs a significant amount of reform. We are, as a committee of the CQC, the statutory body set up to listen to patients, and we're not resourced sufficiently to do that, and we do make that case. Um, David has been very clear with me that we need to continue to make that case and, and, and make uh, make sure that people understand the value of Health Watch, so that we're not funded for the sake of it, but we can actually show uh, the impact we have for uh, people out there. When I make my visits to local Health Watch, I'm making one uh, tonight that will go up to Peterborough and Cambridgeshire. Uh, they're increasingly bringing in the uh, integrated care board chair and chief executive to those meetings, such as the importance that they attribute to both listening to and being seen to listen to, to the voice of the, the patient, the evidence voice of the patient, which is encouraging. The demand is there, the need is there. I don't see which hand went up first, but Tyson or Chris? Chris. Um, just to say um, to Louise and her team, uh, just a thank you, because of the work that you're doing to, to help us with our, our thinking around state of care, 
particularly in the focus around dentistry, but also in other areas uh, like our work on systems, uh, like our work in mental health, like our work on access more generally, including to primary care. All of the things that we report about in state of care and other places, in part, comes from the work of you and, and your team. I know you I know you know that, but it's, just, it's an opportunity just to say uh, thank you for that work. And the work of the local health bodies delivery and you know people being happy to be at, to be at work um, we do already have a set of values I don't think they were uh, kind of potentially driven from the from the ground up so the process that David and I have put in place is that we've held a series of workshops with committee with staff with the local health watch network the local health watch network are st still in those workshops and through a really kind of wonderful um, set of discussions each group in in our organization is coming up with very similar values so i've asked for a set of values to be created around about sort of five values which really encapsulate the work we do and everybody at the moment is coming up with identical values things like candor things like equity collaboration and then once we've you know decided on what those kind of five six values are we will go ahead uh, and determine the behaviours that, that lie beneath that and then how we'll hold each other to account, um, all of the staff and all of the volunteers, for delivering on those, on those values. And then we will try and we'll have a piece of work to keep that alive and keep it meaningful uh, and testing it out and putting it in appraisals and so on, so that that's really embedded as, as part of who we are as an organisation. Because it's the behaviours that are the important thing. The values themselves, yes, they're important, but it's only through the behaviours that you see those uh, values being evidenced. And uh, as Louisa said, it is vital that uh, culture work is not top-down. It involves everybody, and then everyone feels that they are committed to it, they feel a sense of parentage for it, and therefore they, they want to live up to it. Thank you, David. Any last questions? I, I just had, James, it's probably almost more one for you unless Louise wants to add, but I, I was just interested in, we've touched on this a little bit already, but just interested in uh, your perception from the uh, work we're doing with ICS and ICBs of what we expect the role of Health Watch to be, both locally and indeed its, its use to us. I think we've made a presumption in the work that we've done that Health Watch is a, a facilitator of voice into the ICS, so we expect to see, as it were, that in action. And uh, and actually, without commenting on the specifics of the pilots, um, the reports of which aren't published yet, I, I can anticipate a, a theme emerging that that might not be the case, actually. And I think it probably backs up what Louise is saying about the reality of... of sometimes how complex and large ICSs are and the, the difference between the ICB and the ICP and those two relationships. But I suspect that we'll find more to do and some good practice guidance emerging as a result. Can I just add very briefly there? That I think there are some areas of the country where the, where the Health Watch or the groups of Health Watch really work very closely and are very kind of uh, embedded in the work of the ICS. I think West Yorkshire is a good example, but there are others. And then there are some areas of the country where actually listening to patient experience through whatever means, Health Watch or you know, other, other means of engagement, uh, hasn't, hasn't taken priority. So I think it's more about variation than, you know, it, than is, it, is it happening at all? Can I just make a final comment, Chair?
That is really a, about the ICS, the ICV, your point uh, that you've just referred to. When we set up the, uh, the ICS system, the Alzira system uh, in this country, one of the things about that system developed in Spain was it was fundamentally about operating at neighborhood level, secondly at place level, and only thirdly at system level. And one of the things that our Health Watch local network allows us to do is to operate very much at neighborhood as well as place level. And that's something that the integrated care systems and the integrated care boards are tending to operate quite significantly at system level. So I think we're a great facilitator in bringing about the right kind of focus for the integrated care boards. Okay, well, thank you very much. And James, thank you for a beautifully crafted response to my uh, question. We look forward to seeing the variation and perhaps getting an understanding of why it happens and the consequences. Uh, <clears throat> David, thank you for the introduction. Louise, um, thank you for coming. Uh, you may take your soapbox, and I hope you manage to get your tray. <laughs> thank you. Um, other colleagues, can I, I promise, try and take a 10 minute break if we could try to be back for uh, 10 2 with two important items to address and then uh, some uh, internal governments? But 10 minutes. Thank you. We now have a couple. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for switching my mic on here. Um, I usually start with a request for everyone else to do it right, and I'm always the first to get it wrong. Thank you. Um, the uh, we two important things now. The first is the um, update on the LLRC. So, James, I think you're going to head this up, but Helen Rawlings, one of our colleagues, thank you uh, for joining us. You might, uh, when we get to you, just introduce yourself to everyone else, given the fact we have some, some new colleagues. Uh, but, James, can I hand this over to you? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, yes, so we've, we're joined by uh, uh, Helen Rawlings um, from the uh, uh, Adult Social Care part of regulatory leadership. Uh, Helen's uh, got a, an, an improvement uh, and um, uh, in, uh, integrated uh, role, actually. So it's a natural uh, leadership uh, for this. So this, um, as, as the board will see from the paper, this is part of our ongoing reporting back uh, to the board about the learning, listening, uh, and responding to concerns um, uh, work. The action plan of which came May last year. We had an update in September. This is another uh, update. And um, the board will remember that at our, our last meeting, we were updating ourselves on the work of the Strategic Oversight and Prioritisation uh, Committee, SOPIC, who have taken, as it were, this piece of work and the broader recommendations monitoring work into sort of slightly more cohesive and um, simpler uh, over oversight. Um, so um, we're at a very crucial time with this piece of work. So it's important, obviously, for the board to receive an update on progress between last September and now, and, and uh, Helen will go into the detail of that. But we're also in the run-up to a, a, a larger consideration at the board um, or of the more independent evaluation of the progress that we've made in this area. So we are underway with the preparation uh, for that in, in the background to this. And again, Helen will be able to uh, outline um, the nature of, um, of that work uh, as well. But I'll hand over to Helen for the detail. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. So, um, so I'm Helen Rawlings. I'm a Deputy Director for CQC, and I cover, as James said, a portfolio of integrated care, inequalities and improvement. And as of January this year, I'm pleased to have taken on a supporting leadership role um, for the important recommendations that we all know about and the associated work as a result of the listening, learning and responding to concerns review. Today, I'll give an update to board regarding the progress um, and present a forward view of the work and the outputs for the review in the coming months. So we are now um, around 10 months from the initial review pres presented to board in March, March last year. And resultantly, we know that recommendations uh, were accepted and the action plan against these recommendations um, presented in May of last year. So in September, as James said, we presented a progress update. And today, I'm pleased to update that further progress has been made against the recommendations from the re review as outlined in the paper. 
The work continued uh, since September has been led by our senior owners and really important contributions across the whole of CQC, many others from the organisation contributing to the work. And I think it should be really acknowledged that the focus on this work has been held with the utmost importance. Um, and our staff across the CQC are really committed to meeting the recommendations and really sharing that strong culture of improvement that we know that can come from this. So you'll also see from the performance chart in the paper that um, there's still really important work to do um, and therefore we really mustn't lose our focus on this um, and we should ensure that our staff, the public and our providers really see and really importantly feel the change as the result of the review. So in the paper I've highlighted some of the work completed since October um, and I'd also like to highlight some additional examples really that have, have come to fruition in the last few weeks. So we've um, appointed two new Freedom to Speak Up guardians, um, development sessions for the executive team and the board around Freedom to Speak Up have also been delivered and the board completed the first part of their independently led training and development on race and inclu inclusion with further work being undertaken on this in the coming months. Our inclusive mentoring scheme has launched for 2024 um, and a really important further update to our standard operating procedure on how we manage our information of concern. This is really important um, and thorough work which has taken place to make sure that all of our staff are really clear and confident to manage any information that comes into us and that when we record this it's done really to the highest expected standard. And finally, we've updated our approach to human rights and included learning for our staff around how we deliver that um, and how we're able to apply that to our work across, across CQC. So you'll also see from the paper that the leadership governance and assurance regarding progress against the recommendations has been strengthened. Um, we've made sure that how we work together to achieve the aims um, of the review has additional leadership support from myself um, and they're also reporting and oversight on how we're doing is monitored clearly and consistently in the organisation. The aim is to ensure that if we face any challenges or barriers to achieving the high expectations set out in the review, that these can really be addressed quickly and effectively through that process. And finally, moving on to our commitment for ongoing evaluation. So as recommended in the review, we've got ongoing evaluation work taking, taking place. We now move, as James said, to a really important phase to coincide with the one year and then the 18 month period since we accepted the recommendations. An initial evaluation uh, is planned to report the middle of this year and then further towards the end of this year. We've committed to include independent aspects into that evaluation. So that includes using an independent research agency to conduct some of our qualitative uh, research with staff and partners, and also engage in our independent review panel members. So these, these individuals were really fundamental in the review and will be fundamental going forward to really check and challenge our progress and help identify where we can complete further work. We've included questions in our recent people survey to capture feedback from our staff on progress so far. And we're really ensuring this evaluation work gets to the centre of what matters to our staff at CQC, to our stakeholders who work with us, the public and health and care providers. We really must aspire to embed this change and that this change forms the basis of our ongoing culture and values at CQC, where every interaction that we have, we know really, really matters. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? Well, well, people with their hands up, can I just ask one, uh, partly detail, part quite significant. Um, you've helpfully given us a snapshot of last September and uh, a snapshot now. And I mean, the good thing is most areas are getting better. The glaring exception is speaking up. Indeed, maybe this is a function of the maths, but according to this, the progress to date where the areas of no progress to date are even higher now than they were last September. It's gone up from uh, whatever it was, something to 71%. So we seem to be further behind or we've re-evaluated that we are making progress or something. So, I mean, there's a, not meant to be a cheap shot, there's a minor point on there, but um, what is the problem in freedom to speak up? Why are we making progress everywhere else apart from that one area? It's it. Uh, sure. Um, Ian, it's to do with the secrecy. Now, um, Mark could give you chapter and verse on it, but a, a lot of this is to do with secrecy in the events in the right order, so that impacts on when we can do what we can do over the 18-month period. 
Yeah, abs absolutely right. I, I'm not, there must have been something that went awry with the maths there, I think, because um, we have made significant progress. So bringing on board uh, through a, 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 an organisation-wide uh, uh, recruitment process two new guardians to be able to support the work is going to enable us to really, uh, really supercharge our activity that we're going to do now, which will involve training, engagement, uh, reporting. So there's, uh, that, that is going to enable us to carry on uh, with uh, and complete those activities that are that we haven't made any progress on, um, and of course we had our, bo our board session and our and our ET session, which is um, a, a, a another factor in, in moving us forward in the in the, in the recommendations around speak up. So, um, <coughs> I mean, there is the board development session that uh, Louise led that I referenced earlier, and you've just picked up on, and there were some actions coming out of that, which will come back to the board as specific initiatives. So, um, not asking for precision, but presumably that's quite a big chunk of this red area which we would expect to see close. Yeah, Mark, double Mark. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a similar point. I, I had a problem with this understanding this reporting whether we're on track f f for this or not. You can't actually tell from this because if the if things haven't started, it may be because they were dependent on other things, and therefore that's fine. But equally, it may be that they ought to have started, and lots of other things are dependent on that. So it would be helpful, it would be more helpful to me to see this as, as stacks of what's on track and what's not on track, rather than the actual timing. I think the overall timing we need to see separately as a timeline and where are the big deliverables dropping over over the course of the of, of, of the work but but it, it may well be that a lot of red shouldn't be red I accept that but but it's hard to see what the underlying pattern of of um, uh, orderly progression against a plan is I mean just on that point I'm happy to pick up that and do a, a slightly more uh, friend, friendlier version of this is the differences between should you have done it by now versus have you done it at all? And this is measuring have you done it at all? And so sometimes that's because we haven't, but sometimes it's because it's not, it, it can't have been done by now because certain other things haven't been done. So I, I'll get uh, uh, with uh, Helen a version of what should be achieved, what have we achieved? And I think I, it will I, present it in a better light. I think that, that would be really helpful because the things we want to focus on and try and help around this table are the areas where we're struggling to get things going. We need to do it now, and and there's there's a problem for whatever reason, and those are the those are the barriers that we need to try and uh, help you break through. Yeah, I mean, just just add to that, and there's a few hands going up, but I, without making this overly complicated, it would be helpful to have an understanding of whether if things aren't done, how much of that is the natural sequencing you talked about versus not doing it. And if the barriers, what the barriers are, it's part of the transparency, but is there something the board can do to to help to make sure that we progress this rather more quickly. Um, I saw Stephen's hands go up and then Ali, so I'll take those two and then if there's any others we'll go to those as well. Stephen. Helen, thank you. Really helpful uh, report. Um, I wanted to follow up kind of where you finished, which is that this is giving us a really valuable and helpful snapshot of kind of progress towards tasks and actions following out of the recommendations. But ultimately, we need to move this into a culture, which is a rather more sort of intangible thing to pin down. Have you taken the right tasks and actions to get to the culture that you really want? Could you say a bit more about how this, how this is linking in to the wider work on, on values and culture? Because if that's our end game, kind of we need to see that this is, this is feeding directly into the the wider work on on culture yeah so so the answer to that is yes it absolutely needs to move into that that cultural perspective and i think what's important at this point in the review is that um we make sure we move the frag, frag, fragmentation if you like of the recommendations into more of a frame of reference of the overall aims of the review and then link that directly to the cqc cultural development work um, I think this is, you know, this is my reflection on why the next sort of uh, six to 12 months are really, really important and we mustn't lose our momentum on getting subjective feedback on how people feel, how people um, are able to deliver their work and the difference that this has made to them um, and any um, further challenges that come up. So um, 
is in summary in answer to your question yes it will absolutely be linked to the cultural work and that movement I think to the aims of the review overall um, is probably a, a wise decision to make sure that that interface is really well with that work. Thanks. Kate I think you want to cover this well let me give Ali's question because just conceivably may want to respond to that as well. Ali. Thanks um, just to add to everyone's comments really pleased to see an update on the progression that we've had on this work and that this remains an important priority. I'm also very pleased to see that we are definitely going to be bringing back in our independent panel viewers to give us assurance that we've um, done what we said that we do. In the paper, we're quite clear on a target end date of sometime before the end of the year when it will be presented back to board. And notwithstanding the fact that concluding this program doesn't mean the conclusion of the work and it needs to be embedded, as Stephen said, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about any risks, challenges or threats that we might see that might potentially result in that timeline for this program's conclusion being pushed back. Thank you. So, Helen, if you want to try and respond to that, and I'll perhaps Kate to respond to any of them she wants to add. Yeah, thank you. So I think, Ali, this, this is the really important next step for us. So I think many of our um, senior owners for these actions and people who've been delivering the work are really best placed to reflect on those. Many of them have sort of overcome and identified risks and, and challenges so far. Um, but of course, at this point in time, to embed that into the culture of how we work, there may well be further barriers that exist around that. Um, as we all know, we've had a move on to our new regulatory platform as well. So we have colleagues working um, with, with new systems and processes as well. So um, that interfaces directly with our work around the LLRC as well. So um, for me, it's really important over the next sort of uh, four to six weeks, really, to get a very clear and documented overview of those risks and barriers. Um, and that hopefully will enable both our colleagues, but also at board and executive level to, to make those decisions around how we can overcome those um, as an organisation. So um, just to go back to, to Mark's point, and I suppose with fresh eyes coming in with James and Helen, um, I wonder on reflection, our eagerness to accept all 84 recommendations uh, back in last May and the real appetite in the organisation to get on and start delivering was fantastic. I wonder whether with hindsight, 84 recommendations is a heck of a lot to implement at the same time and actually possibly what might have been more constructive would have been to have mapped out what are the priorities to get done in the first six months, what should we be doing between six and 12 months, and what should we do between 12 and 18 months and, and thereafter. So I think um, I think the challenge, as you say, with this is it's hard to tell whether we're on track or not, because we and our original ambition was to do all of it straight away. So I think that's a bit of a, um, a bit of a lesson for us to take uh, going forward. It came from the right, uh, the right starting point, which is we were eager to get all of this done. Um, but I think the suggestion James had, with, which is now with James and Helen uh, looking at this with fresh eyes, what do we expect to, to deliver over the next kind of three, six, nine months? I think that will help board know whether we're on track uh, on that side. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, yeah, just to note, there's a new new article on the internet um, today about senior leaders undertaking um, race and inclusion training as part of the LLRC, which is really great, great to see. Um, I guess it's just a call from me to encourage leaders to consider that, that training and take it, you know, take it seriously, obviously. Um, and other, any other wider training or, um, you know, ways that you can develop yourselves to consider and um, this more carefully, really. That's it. Thank you, Asha. I was going to ask if you had any observations, so thanks for putting your proverbial hand up. Yes. Thanks, Ellen. So, um, so a number of us had a training session yesterday, um, which was um, very impactful, and I think we are all still processing the discussion in the, the training session. Just a quick kind of fresh reflection from me uh, on, on the session was um, I came into it uh, noting that there's a number of activities that we are doing uh, in this area. So if we think about reverse mentoring, if we think about our inclusive leadership programme, if we think about independent panel members, the list goes on. The challenge we had from our trainer is that you're doing all that activity, but actually when you look at your last set of uh, people results, um, colleagues from black and ethnic minority uh, backgrounds were uh, describing an environment that they would like to see as, as different. So it was it was a very impactful training session. Um, I certainly got, I think, probably a number of us thinking about what 
more what different do we need to do because we're doing a lot of our activity but as the trainer kind of challenged us back is that translating to uh, you know a better experience for that group of colleagues so I think we will probably regroup um, as, a, as a team to think about what next um, and this was always as Helen said this was always going to be the start of a series of um, uh, training and workshops as we tackle the kind of really key issues that came out of LLRC which is around our kind of racial competence across all levels of the organization so we, we started on that journey um, there's a lot more to do um, but that uh, kind of where we stand at this moment I think is uh, just a relook and a, a kind of challenging ourselves about all these things we've got in place are they the right things what's missing what do we need to need to do differently and then seeing that training now roll out through the rest of the organization um, in, in kind of months to come as well thank you thanks Kate if there are no other comments let's uh, pause that but um, James and uh, <coughs> Helen, thanks very much for that. I think you know, we are grateful for the kind of relook uh, and the re impetus, despite my question, you know, clear progress in some way, many ways. Um, Kate, it's interesting you said we agree to everything once. It's funny, it's not quite the member of I think it was always acceptance. It would be take a longer time, and some of this is, is slow burn stuff. Uh, but I agree, we didn't have a sort of map, so maybe it felt like we were trying to do everything in one go. Having made quite a lot of progress in some ways and also learning from other areas, it probably would be a time to, um, if I say draw breath, I don't mean suddenly slow everything down, but I mean just have a, um, a sort of better road map as to the timing we're going to apply to some of this stuff. And maybe that could come back to the board in some way, but we'll leave that with you. Hello, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> one other important uh, point. Uh, we put this out under the heading of um, <coughs> learning from the external environment. I think we'll probably do more of this uh, in future, but uh, we, we are pretty diligent at discussing internally things that we can learn from that are affect us directly. Uh, but there's an awful lot going on in the outside world, which is nothing to do with us in the first instance, but where people draw parallels or there are things that we need to contribute to. So I think there's a few more papers along these lines coming along. But the first of this is uh, Ofsted, uh, obviously a huge amount of commentary. Now, we have a paper in here. Uh, Joyce, I think you put that together. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, it's quite a long paper. We have read it. Uh, but do you want to pick up any key themes for us? And then uh, we'll go straight to questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you Ian. I'll just summarise the key points from the paper uh, before I take uh, any questions. Um, and you're right, um, this is about learning from our external environment and areas that impact on how we regulate. And following the death of the head teacher, Ruth Perry, there have been three uh, reports on Ofsted, um, and probably not the last three. There, there, there may be more because there is really quite a, a bit of learning from uh, the case. And the coroner uh, summarised to say that it was the Ofsted inspection that had contributed um, to her death. And while these reports aren't aimed at us, um, it is appropriate that we review the findings uh, and take the opportunity to learn and reflect on our role um, as a regulator in this space. Um, we've talked about our role with people at the centre of what we do and the fact that our purpose is about ensuring safe, effective, high quality, compassionate care. And there is a delicate balance um, in the way that we listen and respond to providers, knowing that we, our focus is on people first. Um, but it is fair to say that we particularly know that some of our providers who are small and probably medium in, in size um, take regulation in, in a very personal way because it is about the service that, that they deliver. Um, the paper identifies four areas that uh, we feel in response. Um, some of the things we had been doing um, already uh, before some of these reports, but there are four areas that, that help us really upon the road in, in the learning and improvements that we may want to make. And the first is our strategy, which was published in May 2021. And in that, we, we've talked about how regulation must understand the challenges that providers face and the context in which they deliver services. And so we committed really to be a far more collaborative re uh, regulator to 
update our ratings more frequently, to focus on improvement, use all our regulatory levers, not just inspection. So um, assessment, our convening power, our, the, the co-production that we do uh, with others, and use our national voice to raise awareness about health and social care services. Um, we also introduced our, our new single assessment fra framework, which already moves towards some of those recommendations in that we don't have rating limiters. Ratings are legislative, so it's a decision made by um, government, but we are doing more within our single assessment framework to really get the narrative about people's experiences of care and think about how we score as well as rate um, organisations. And there is an element of self-evaluation that providers themselves and trusts uh, local authorities on our uh, integrated care system work where they evaluate themselves to contribute to, the fi to our findings. Um, we also change the nature of our inspection activity. So it's moving to an approach where it's far more collaborative, where we're talking to the people who are in services in terms of what they experience, but also talking to the staff and leaders and looking at the environment in which care is delivered, rather than, um, and I suppose traditionally people may see us, certainly on the television, with a clipboard and a, and a tick sheet and think about compliance, but it, it's definitely our on-site activity will be far more um, collaborative in that space. Um, in terms of relationships, we recognise that that is key to trust and trust in the regulator, and we're going to refocus how we have uh, relationships with providers. Um, probably the paper focuses on the coroner's report and the processes that we need to look at ourselves, and it identifies both where we are dissimilar, um, and there are things that we can do in differently, really, in terms of reporting and the way we um, allow for factual accuracy checks and the way we deliver reports. But there is a lot that we can learn from. And it's outlining the paper how we want to introduce more training um, and support for providers, particularly around uh, well-being um, and areas where there could be distress uh, and people have real concerns about what we do. The report also identifies where we might do our quality assurance differently and how we produce our reports and the timing of those reports and the fairness in, in between when the report's done but when it's actually published and trying to be transparent about, well, a provider has improved during that time, so what can we say about those, those improvements? We will closely um, monitor the implementation of our single assessment framework. It's a new framework. We want to get it right. Um, we have heard from um, early adopters about there's more we can do around the technology and about how, the, how they share information with us, and we're looking to make sure that those improvements are made and our work is not, is not burdensome. And we want to evaluate our new single assessment framework so there aren't any unintended consequences, and we evaluate it to say, is it, is it effective? Is it having the impact that we want in terms of making sure we identify risks, almost certainly, but also look for improvements um, that providers have made? So there's a lot that we're doing in response. I'll stress that my paper is not a delivery plan, so it's not, you know, we are doing these things and there are timescales attached, but we have considered the points that we uh, need to learn uh, and the areas that we want to improve. Um, so I'll pause there and uh, respond to any questions. So, Stephen. As in Christine, is it? Uh, Christine, hello, um, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I welcome this review um, from a people point of view and from a process point of view. Um, and I just think it's important to note that Ruth Perry's tragic death resonated very significantly with particularly providers of social care who, as you say, take it very personally. And, you know, sometimes their jobs are on the line, but it's really important to recognise that it's um, a process that is frequently very difficult. Both, I mean, obviously we don't know the impact of, of these sort of assessment processes yet, but the inspection and all the different assessments that are happening are um, very stressful for pretty much everybody on the front line, at, at the very least. Um, it's our job. That's what we've got to do. And I recognise that we are trying to do that in um, a, a, in an improved way and in a collaborative way. But I think it's just important to keep in mind that this is always going to be difficult for, for people who are on the receiving end of it. Steve. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Re really helpful report, and I think it is a really good example of sort of learning from uh, other sectors to reflect on how we, we do what we do. I very much welcome uh, what you were saying about sort of building into our own training, just sort of thinking about awareness of 
the, the, the psychological effects on the people that we're dealing with so that we get better at spotting you know, states of distress. I think that, that, that is a really positive move. It's what Ofsted have done. I think, I think we should also be training our people uh, similarly. Secondly, sort of the issue about consistency in any, in any regulator or inspector, which is dependent on very large numbers of people supposedly applying a standard methodology in a standard way, but actually inconsistency always creeps in. So continuing to think about how do we know that our intended approach is being carried out consistently in, in each case, because I think part of the learning from, from Ofsted is that it, it, the, the effect on the provider can too often be dependent on the particular inspection team you get. So thinking about uh, uh, consistency. And, and then the third point, I, I really welcome, Joyce, what you were saying about the importance of understanding the experience of providers of our new single assessment framework, but hoping, and I'm sure this is the intention, that kind of that isn't just about the technology and is it easy or difficult to upload stuff and do you get the right data and so on. It's also kind of more profoundly, I think, getting at is the experience of providers of the single assessment framework genuinely getting them to believe that if they enter into all of this in the right spirit, not of fear and trepidation, mm -hmm. but believing that they can learn from this themselves and can improve from this themselves in, in, in their own uh, setting, that, that would be a really valuable and important thing. Because our ability to promote improvement in providers is very much dependent on whether they own the results of what we do with them and for them, or go into a state of sort of fear and denial. So, I, I, sorry, very long-winded way of saying, I, I really hope that the way we evaluate the effect of the single assessment framework on providers will try to get at that experience of providers. Does, do they believe this is genuinely helping them to get better? If so, I think we'll be doing something hugely important. Thanks. Can I, can I respond to that? Um, if I may, I'll, I'll respond to the first and second points, and maybe Tyson might want to talk to uh, consistency. Um, you're absolutely right. The, the training is going to be important for the psychological effects, but it, it, there is two types of training I describe in the paper, the, the ones for providers and maybe others that work with us, but also for our operational colleagues or themselves who, who, who also uh, face difficult situations and perhaps just uh, not all, only in one-off situations, but some of the things that come um, uh, flooding through the doors on a continuous basis, which can be particularly stressful for our own operations colleagues. So there, there's, there's two types of training that's been described here. And then the second issue, I think you're absolutely right. The, the movement of improvement, if you like, happens when tr providers trust what we say and have confidence in the judgments that we make and then make the, the improvements themselves. So there are two parts to that. First of all, it's really key to get our judgments right because at the end of the day, there are people using services. So if the judgments are right, then we, we can get make progress. And secondly, if regulation is seen as being part of a continuous cycle of improvement rather than something that comes to say you're not doing something right, but it's a, a, that continuous cycle, then we're only going to get health and social care improving for everyone rather than um, regulation being seen as something else. It is part, I, I, I would say this, I'm the Director of Policy and Strategy, but regulation is part of that cycle of improvement from quality improvement all the way through to the, the support that regulation can uh, uh, provide to providers and the system and others to make improvements themselves. Tyson, I think you wanted to come in with a response, and then I've got two of the three marks down here. Can we, um, after that, I think, close it down, unless there's anything further? But uh, Tyson, do you want to go first with a response? I, I wanted to pick up on a couple of um, Stephen's points, and then I think Chris will pick up on the, the provider point. Um, 
On the training, I think we're cl I've been working closely with our academy on what this might look like, and I think we're close to coming up with a proposal which will go to the People and Culture Committee soon. It's built around empathy, um, strategies for how to deal with people who are demonstra demonstrating signs of distress, but also, importantly, I think, for our own people, um, self-care and how, how to do a proper debrief after they've been involved in what is clearly a very uncomfortable situation. I'm hoping that we can start to roll that out rel relatively soon. I'm kind of looking at many at the moment, but, but let, let's see um, what, what the discussion that the People and Culture Committee comes to. On consistency, I think um, one, of the, one of the advantages of the single assessment framework is that we are, we are scoring evidence categories at a fairly granular level, so the report will be built up from evidence which is captured at quite a local level, and I also think that we have much better transparency um, of, of data at the moment, including um, how reports are being written, how people are rating particular evidence categories, that we can use our quality assurance mechanisms to try and see if we are, if we are behaving in, in a consistent manner. So I think that well, that will help in that regard as well. But that's, that, you're right, that's a really important point. Ian, yeah, sorry, I think you wanted a quick comment as well. Yeah, just, just uh, I think, to just build on Tyson's point, this incremental up and incremental down, I think, avoids the sort of the big surprise of why things have changed. So we should be able to say to someone, look, actually, you're good, but you're starting to drift. So therefore, it's less of a surprise. I think it's point one, a sort of technical point, which I think is a big single assessment framework plus. I think an area that I know that Ofsted are also thinking about is having trained their teams in how to recognise distress in providers, what do they then do? Um, because you know, if you're a large hospital chief executive, you would work with your board and, and others to seek support in a range of different ways. If you're an owner-operated domiciliary care business, what, what do you do? Um, and, and I think there is probably something for us, perhaps in partnership with, with Ofsted and maybe other regulators around connecting with third parties, with mental health charities and others to say, look, we've recognised an issue here, we'd like to sort of signpost you to someone else, because I think there is a risk for us as a regulator, is we become a regulator, but we also de facto take on a, some kind of employer uh, vicarious liability, which, which is not our, our role, and we should be clear about that. But I think our teams, I know, would naturally want to help, so we need to give those teams some tools to tangibly help people as well. Thank you. Uh, please, I walk track of RT, then Mark Chambers. Uh, thank you. Keep it very brief. I, one, I just really welcome this report. I think actually, you know, you, you mentioned there that we're encouraging people to become a continuous learning environment and organisations. This is a role model, I think, of how we're trying to do that ourselves. And I hope it's one of many that we start to actually think about how can we get learnings from uh, and advance them. Uh, I also welcome the fact that there's some very sort of concrete uh, ideas for how we can actually apply the learnings from this. And it sounds from Tyson that there's even reassurance that we've got a plan within that to say, okay, what does a training program look like? I think it will be important just to revisit this even very briefly, just to see, you know, three months and six months in, have we made a difference in the way that we operate? Have we got new support uh, out of this? Have we actually done that improvement? Uh, doesn't need to be weighty or heavy or require specific reporting, but just that check-in to say, did we make the difference that we hoped it would make? Yeah, and I'd agree with that. Uh, uh, this is incredibly important. I think the I think the pro proposed responses are the right ones, and it, it's uh, um, you know it's indicative again that you can draw learnings and insight from um, situations which are distinct from yours, and um, there's always learnings for, for for everyone. So I think the I think the responses are right. Um, uh, <coughs> I understand we weren't talking about timelines today, but I think I think tracking it in the way that Marx had suggested would be helpful because I think actually this is these are subtle and quite difficult interventions. This training is not going to be like the sort of training that we've that we're routinely d delivering, and I think for it to be impactful, it's got to cover you know it's got to cover our SPAs and and others who are involved in in inspections as well. So it it won't be. Um, it won't be straightforward to deliver this, but it would be really important, and it certainly has my very strong support that, that we're doing this. It's good to see. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so, look, Joyce, uh, thanks very much for the paper. I think you know, it, it, it's been really helpful, both as a model for, for, for looking at things, uh, but also, you know, it does two key things. It explains, on the one hand, for those who sometimes look at offset of us and put us together, and we're not, we're very different in some ways. On the other hand, 
there's always something you can learn, and I think that's being taken on board. I think Christine, in her comments, made a really good point earlier that the existence of this tragic case has changed the landscape in some of the people regulating. So some of what we're doing, it's not we're not trying to say that we, um, and I'm making this point partly if any of our, our colleagues are listening online, we're not suddenly saying that we've been doing it badly. We're just saying we need to respond to the fact the world has changed. Um, my, albeit very limited experience, I have to say, going to inspections is a lot of people are very good at this, the ones I come across. Um, <coughs> uh, but it, it is stressful. It's extra stressful if it's a care home because you have no notice. You know, I've been there and seen the look of joy on the face of a care home manager when we walk in and say we're from Oxted. Um, it's also really important um, for both care homes and independent sectors. It came up there on the call I was on because this is their livelihood. If, you know, the rating, losing a livelihood, losing a rating or dropping the rating can affect livelihood. So. The stress is absolutely enormous. So I think we recognise the change in environment and responding. What we do in the future, I think, can I leave it with you to think about that? I'm not sure that, I'm dubious about having a specific tracking mechanism for everything, but one way or another, I think it would be really helpful in a few months' time, let's say six rather than the next board meeting, just to say, with the benefit of six months' experience and um, you know, putting our people through the programme, I mean, they will have their own views and, and they will have better feedback than us on how care home providers in particular are responding to the Ruth Perry case and doing so. I think it would be quite helpful to have that sort of feedback if we could capture that as an action. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Joyce. Um, <clears throat> we move on to just uh, uh, finally a few governance things. So uh, Jeremy, um, can I turn to you just for a quick oral update on anything from the last direct meeting? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just want to give some feedback from the last ARAC meeting held in December. I think it's worth just pausing slightly um, and breaking this down into financial years. So our accounts for the year ending the March 23rd are not yet finalised. Um, this was anticipated and it's caused, um, in common with a number of other uh, organisations, about a delay in the audit of local authority pension schemes, which are partly incorporated in our accounts and are a material item for us. So we cannot complete our own accounts until that is done, and that is likely to be uh, a few months away yet, or will be a few months away yet. Um, but having said that, the work uh, to finalise our annual report and accounts is pretty much there, just subject to those final changes, and the NAO have been doing our audit, and so far to date nothing untoward has been identified. So we're progressing, although this long delay is not helpful for anybody very much, um, so we do have to reflect on how we can adjust the final hour act to make sure that people understand the delay and why it's happened. Um, looking now to the current financial year, um, firstly looking at internal audit, the good news is um, our plan is proceeding uh, as desired. Um, in the last committee meeting we discussed three reports, stakeholder engagement, confidentiality and access management, and governance and assurance arrangements. A number of recommendations were raised in all, all three of those, um, but I don't think there's anything particular I need to draw attention to the board, um, and individual uh, management responses have been received and plans are in place uh, to follow up on those actions. Um, the next thing we look at is the progress on the existing bank of actions, um, and that's come up in our private board meeting this morning, and there is good progress on that. We still have a little bit to do, um, but the, the Audit Committee is very much focusing on the ones that are missing the deadlines, the ones that require extensions, and indeed the ones that have been hanging around for a long time and actually may now not really be relevant in this, the way in which they were originally phrased. So that's a continuing program, progress, but we are in a reasonably good shape. I think it's just worth noting um, uh, uh, on, a, on a balance of transparency that we are changing our internal auditors. Um, we have uh, appointed the Government Internal Audit Agency to be our internal auditors from April, um, and indeed, uh, at the same time, we have given notice to our current internal auditors, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, who have been in that role for probably five years now. Um, so I should just note thanks to their work uh, and anticipating a, uh, a good finalisation of the current plan and handover to, to, do, to GIAA. Um, the next stage we look at is risk and risk management. Um, and we have um, updated and looked at all the risks, uh, particularly looking at those that are not progressing back to green in the way we would like, and that's a continued, uh, continued role for the Audit Committee. Uh, and we also had a, a chance to have a look at the new risk management system that's been developed, which should give us a much 
easier way to manage progress, show what we're doing, and I think we'll be a real step forward, and that is um, pretty complete now. This needs to have all the data put in it, but we'll get there. Um, then we also looked at uh, tran transformation, particularly important at this time where we are in the programme, um, to give uh, additional assurance to the board that um, the relevant controls and processes are in place, and there's a specific role for the Audit Committee on approving and monitoring uh, use of contingent labour, and we discharge that. Uh, again, no issues to raise. Uh, and there were four things we also looked at. There's a busy, busy meeting. Um, update from Health Watch England and the National Gardens Office. Actually, both of the, um, the presentations earlier in this meeting reference back to that. Uh, we also looked at cyber resilience and our work on that. And I think it is worth noting that we genuinely feel that we're in a much stronger position um, in the last year or so as we've rolled out the new technology and also adapted uh, to the threats we see. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed. Um, uh, there's been good progress there, which gives us some assurance that we're we're on top of that, um, always being um, uh, uh, aware that the risk is changing all the time. So not complacent, but, but in a good place. And then finally, counter-fraud, um, uh, where uh, we're doing some extra work to look at the new government functional standards around that and make sure we're aligned. Um, we're, in a fraud sense, we're not a particularly large organisation, so we need to be proportionate, but there is work underway to do that. So that was the update of the meeting, unless anyone has any questions. No questions. Can I just add? I mean, one thing you didn't mention, obviously, as we introduced earlier, we have a new um, newly appointed chair of the ARAC, so we have arrangements in hand to affect a smooth handover. Um, but, Jeremy, on behalf of the board, I'd just like I know everyone thinks you've done a fantastic job. Very difficult to ask you to stand in, uh, and uh, <coughs> it was um, we're very pleased we asked you to cover that interim period. But, can I just say thank you on everyone's behalf for the work that you've done? We do appreciate it. Um, Mark, uh, brief oral update on our GC, please. Yep, very happy to do that. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, as a reminder, uh, uh, the RGC is uh, sort of broken into to two parts. Um, we we look at a, a, a regular core paper uh, where we look at the uh, changes to the design, we look at the delivery, and we look at the uh, measures that we have indicators we have about the effectiveness of our regulatory model. So that's the first part. And then the second part, we generally do a, a deep dive on a particular topic that we would not have time um, to to talk about at board. Um, I think the key thing is actually a lot of what came up in the core paper we have covered today. So I won't, I won't cover that today. I think more, more, more than any other um, RGC I've experienced, the same things came up on board uh, today, but it was a much improved uh, paper. So thank you to the executive team for the effort in um, getting us to a smarter, smaller deck that um, much more clearly gave visibility to the issues that are concerning management. So I think it was a more allowed us for more focused meeting as a result. I think of all the things, and you know, the metrics that are in there are are better, but they will continue to to evolve as the um, uh, uh, single assessment framework and our new m methodology for um, regulation beds in. We'll find the right measures that give us the insights that we need at the uh, at the committee. I think probably of all the things that we talked about today, the only thing that you know, perhaps just one thing I would mention was just to, as a as a mirror to the update on the LLRC uh, actions, there have been quite a lot of recommendations that we have accepted over the years from a variety of sources. So the ones that are, aren't in the LLRC, we're trying to track those at, at, at RGC. Um, uh, you, you know, similar story, uh, more than half of those are delivered or close to completion, but at the next meeting we'll have a a closer look at the ones that are that, that that are stalled to understand again is that for good reason or are we just having difficulty getting them going um, uh, the deep dive was uh, you know was on whistleblowing which I hope gives um, uh, those joining the meeting remotely um, some assurance as to how 
important it is to us. We've got to make sure that people feel a maximum level of confidence in raising issues and concerns directly, directly with us. Uh, and you know, we 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 were encouraged to see the 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 the, the enhancements and improvements that we're trying to drive in that um, space. Um, our next meeting is seventeenth uh, of April. Thank you, Kate. A uh, couple of uh, final matters. Um, we've got the uh, minutes of the last meeting in the pack. They were circulated before. Uh, what you have in front of you is what was circulated. So can I take those as proof? Thank you very much. Um, and we have in the pack uh, the actual log. Um, two items are shown as outstanding um, but on track and not yet due. Uh, two we've shown as closed. Uh, one is closed by virtue of the fact that it's just been accepted as something we've done on an ongoing basis, so I suggest that's closed. So um, I'm happy with that log, if everyone else is. Um, I think in terms of the formal business, then, that brings us to any other business. So is there anything else anybody wanted to raise? I don't think I've missed anybody. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much indeed uh, to colleagues. Um, for, um, sorry we're a few minutes over, but only just, but thank you very much indeed. There's some good discussions there and a few things to follow up on. That's the end of the formal business, um, but uh, as usual, we do offer members of the public the opportunity to ask questions. So we've only got three today. I'm going to ask Chris and Tyson to respond to them. I hope you've been forewarned. If not, you'll have to make it up as you go along. Um, the first question is one for you, Chris. Uh, how will the work of CQC change during the period of a UK general election? Uh, thanks for the question. So, um, in accordance with uh, Cabinet Office guidance, um, ALBs during a pre-election period are asked to uh, really uh, hone down to discharge their regulatory functions only. But for us, our regulatory functions are uh, inspections of providers and, um, and obviously uh, inspections of local authority and ICSs. What we've done in the past, uh, particularly for ICSs and, uh, uh, and LAs, is um, not publish those documents uh, during the pre-election period, but still carry out the activity. So it wouldn't stop our regulatory activity. It wouldn't stop us taking enforcement action if we felt that we needed to protect people who use services. Uh, but we would, we would not seek to, to, to publish those documents. And actually, as, as we're, we're developing our plan for this, um, over, that, over that short period of time, which is uh, the formal pre-election period, uh, we wouldn't choose to publish it at a, at, a, uh, at a system level, but still carry on at a provider level. Uh, and we'll, 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 we'll do that in, in sort of co cooperation with the Cabinet Office. The Cabinet Office, as we get closer to an election, will set out the actual days of a pre-election period. So they aren't, they aren't determined yet, and they are slightly at the behest of the Cabinet Office, but we'll work with that, uh, that, that, that data and that guidance when it comes out. So it's something that might shift the delivery of some things, but the core business carries on as usual, basically. Yeah. Uh, the next question is for you as well, Chris. Um, interesting one. What communications are there with the Secretary of State concerning serious issues in NHS services? So uh, it's important that we are able to share our concerns with all services, but particularly for the NHS, with senior partners, including the Secretary of State. So we would regularly share uh, with uh, her and her team, the w her wider team, any serious concerns that we had around NHS services and anything where we, were, where we were due to take action which would result in a change to the way that service operates. But we wouldn't just share it with, with her, we'd also share it with colleagues in, in, in NHS England because they may well be responsible for the action that follows, follows our action. So um, we would absolutely and do on a regular basis share our concerns. Uh, say particularly with, with other colleagues that have responsibility for those services nationally uh, and then uh, we'll use that to as a, as a preempt for anything that we put out to the public and the wider, uh, the wider media. Okay, thank you Chris. Uh, and last question is one for you Tyson, rather more specific. How does the CQC currently engage with the prison inspections to regulate their health services? And, and thank you for the question. Um, we have statutory powers to register, monitor and inspect regulated health activities delivered by health providers in the prison estate. 
as the quality of health care may be impacted by the effective effectiveness of the wider prison regime, we adopt a partnership approach with HM Inspectorate of Prisons to deliver the prison inspection through a joint inspection framework. During these joint inspections, we inspect the delivery of health care and HMIP inspect the treatment of, of, of prisoners and wider conditions. Each inspection leads to a joint report. Should our inspection activity identify a breach of health care standards, then a, se a separate report will set out our evidence of breach and any action we are taking. There may be situations where we will inspect as a single agency if the evaluation of risk determines that a separate on-site inspection is re required, but in summary, we work very closely with the Inspector of Prisons. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tyson. So that's all the questions. I hope that answered them for the satisfactorily for those that asked them. So we've already closed the meeting. I think that's it for the questions. So for anyone listening in, thank you for doing so. And we will uh, see you at the next meeting at the end of March. Thank you.